Hey you. Um, I wasn't actually going to do this tonight, but I already, well, let's just say I went and started compiling several of the questions since I opened the forum to a new uh, Q&A. And it's a significant enough list that I think I'm just going to go ahead and do that now <laughs> and push through this. I really had no idea so many people would be asking me so many questions, to be honest with you. I'm not complaining. But, you know, by goodness, I'm not complaining. It's just kind of weird. All right, I need to turn the lighting down, don't I? Get rid of some of the glare. There we go. I just really wasn't expecting it, to be honest with you. I really wasn't expecting so many people to have a level of interest in my little <laughs> dinky little show that I do here off on the side. So, thank you for watching, and I'll, I'll go ahead and start the Q&A. Now, there's one question I want to go over first really quick. Um, there's also one other question I'm not actually answering in this video. That's because it's a lengthy topic that deserves its own discussion about a new bill that's being passed, CISPA, C-I-S-P-C-A, and my thoughts on it. Uh, in summary, I think it's bad, but the reasons why are more complicated than I can go into in, in a Q&A like this. So I apologize, I will cover your question later, sir, but uh, for now I'm trying to get through what I got. Now, the, the question I've been asked so often is, are you going to do podcasts? Up until rather recently, the answer to that has basically been no. I, I uh, have no experience in doing podcasts. I have no real knowledge or, or uh, understanding of how that works exactly. Because it kept being asked, and it kept being asked, and it just kind of kept coming up, I've decided I'm going to go ahead and look into the idea and look into the options, so it is now on the table. Um, feel free to add your comments, of course. I'm not going to open that to actual discussion yet. The biggest question I'm going to have to come up with whenever I get around to figuring out how much it's going to cost me in order to get the hosting service is, do I do audio or do I do video like this, you know, like I do here on YouTube? And if I did do that, what I would do, I could tell you right now, in case anyone's curious, I'd do both. I would do the YouTube upload, and then I'd, you know, compress it into something I could put onto the uh, the podcast, and then upload that separately, so that people could do one or the other or both, however they see fit. But that's that is on the table now. It wasn't prior, because honestly, I didn't think there was a reason for it. I didn't think there was really a demand for it. But I hit 2,000 subscribers recently, which is mind-boggling. My goodness. <laughs> so, huh. Now. I have uh, these questions. I do apologize; are in no particular order. Part of the reason is it's already like 1:30, 1:40 uh, actually, and I spent I guess about the last 50 minutes uh, just compiling the questions themselves. Never mind putting them in order. So I do apologize, but I'm just going to try and get through these and answer these as detailed and as completely as I can. First question: What uh, uh, so this person was asking about how I think we're actually on the the slide out into another uh, golden age of video gaming. And he mentioned, what do I think of several of the results of this, such as Infinite Space, Ghost Trick, Catherine? Uh, my thoughts on this are, I really love it when a game does something interesting or new or exciting. I can give you another excellent example of this, Flower. Uh, I know Flower got a lot of attention for basically the wrong reasons, if, you'll, if I can be blunt about it. But I did enjoy Flower. I liked Flower, and I thought it was an interesting game, and it was interesting interactive medium, because calling it a game is almost saying too much, isn't it? But it was someone, someone trying something new, and that's what I liked about it. You know, like, uh, uh, actually a better example of what I'm talking about would be uh, a game, I can't think of the name of it. Shoot. It was a first-person uh, running game, basically. You know, it was this white city, and you run through the... I, I can't think of the name of it. I could probably go look it up, but it doesn't matter that much. It was a game that I didn't think was very good, but that wasn't the point. It was it, The fact is the market has reached a point and is reaching a point now where it's getting easier to develop in an indie sense and it's getting easier to try things rather than having to s fit the default. And while you may not make a lot of money doing that, you can make some money doing that, you know, as, as Catherine and, and Ghost Trick and Infinite Space all uh, have, have, uh, have exemplified, especially Catherine. And so the idea is there that we can try things. Whether they fail or, su or succeed, we are still trying new stuff, and I like that. I love it. I'm, I'm definitely on board with that whole concept. And maybe someone else could come along and take that innovative idea and do it correct or do it better, you know? I have no problem with that either. I'm all for it. So uh, next question. Oh, this was someone actually correcting me, but he also asked what I thought on the matter uh, about the fact that BioWare is not actually making Command & Conquer. It's just another team under the BioWare name. The truth is, uh, Electronics Arts, EA, does this a lot. They make, you know, this is now the Blah Division, and this is now the Blah Division, but it's just a name. The people working at the division are not people from Westwood. The people working at the division are not from Maxis. You know, they just, what why EA does is just kind of moves people around like they're set pieces, you know, and they could just shuffle them wherever. And, uh, you know, to be completely honest, a lot of corporations do that, so, you know, I, I think that's kind of crummy. I think it's trying to 
pull on the label, if you know what I mean. It's a Bioware game, so it'll be good. As I've discussed in one of my very, very first reviews way back, the difference between companies and teams, the team is really what matters, not the label, not the developer t t company, you know. The specific team that made the game, that's what determines whether or not that game is going to be good or not, in my opinion. And, of course, the obvious problems of the publisher and whether or not they have development time and uh, ETAs, budget issues, that kind of thing, but moving on. Have I ever played Wing Commander? Yes, of course, God, yes, I've played Wing Commander. I played the holy heck out of that game. Uh, I should say those games, that series. But I did enjoy Wing Commander. It wasn't actually one of my favorites personally, but at the same time, it had this certain appeal to it that I almost can't explain, you know. It was enjoyable, and I really got into it, and it's the same time, it wasn't I don't, I don't even know how to explain it. It wasn't one of my favorites, but it was one I really enjoyed, so I have nothing negative to say about it, I guess is what I'm going for here. Uh, the Wing Commander Saga, I haven't actually picked that up yet, uh, but I am very much looking forward to it. I can't wait to dig into that. Uh, I'm not even sure if it's done yet, to be honest with you. I haven't looked in several months, but, you know, here's hoping, as they say. Uh, this is an interesting question. Someone asked, I've never played an MMO. What do I need to get started? Obviously, a, a PC that can play something. Uh, is, is obviously required here. Nowadays, depending on the game you pick, your PC specs don't have to be that high because most MMOs are designed to hit a broader market and therefore can be scaled down in terms of graphics rather easily. But I'll tell you what you do need is time. What an MMO is, if I can say this very briefly, is a long-term game. It's not necessarily when you play multiplayer. It's not necessarily when you play with, with friends or in PvP or raiding. Those are all things you can do in an MMO. But what an MMO is, is a game that you play over an extended period of time. It's intended to be a game you don't complete, in other words. Now, the degree to which that is true varies. For example, Tor in my opinion, Star Wars uh, The Old Republic, is a game you do complete because it is essentially a single-player game with rating and, and PvP tacked on, or for rather eight single-player games. And by contrast, something like WoW or uh, Rift is another good example, or EverQuest is actually probably the best example I could ever use, is a game that just doesn't stop. There is no completing it, there is no finale, you just kind of keep going. Asheron's Call would be another excellent example, by the way, because the story keeps going in Asheron's Call. Uh, and in WoW. But you get the idea. So you, it, if you want to get into that kind of thing, uh, what you really need to do, in my opinion, is to have some kind of long-term goal-oriented thing going on. You know, I want to hit max level. I want to finish all the quests. I want to see the storyline. I want to check out all the PvP. You know, I want to end game PvP and get good at it and, you know, finish in top blah on the season. I want to raid these raids. I want to raid all the raids. You know, you set a goal for yourself and say, this this is what I want to do. This is how I want to go. And and work towards it. And take your time. There's no rush. You know, a lot of people balk at subscription fees, and I don't blame them. But it's worth noting that $15 a month, when you really get down to it, is not that expensive, especially if that's more or less your entertainment budget. And it is very viable for a good MMO to be the only thing you play. Uh, that's not true for me personally, of course, but you get the concept. <clears throat> uh, what is my th this is a three part question what is my favorite video game soundtrack that's actually kind of a toughie because as I've mentioned before I'm not a fan of artists I'm not a fan of composers I'm not a fan of soundtracks I'm a fan of songs and so I guess statistically speaking uh, Final Fantasy 6, Secret of Mana, Chrono Trigger would all be ones that I like percentage wise more than most you know, definite up there. A lot of SNES games in general are on the top of my list. A lot of PS2 games as well, and a few GameCube games, um, as well as several PC games. Uh, Morrowind also deserves a special example for Jeremy Sue. <laughs> I always say his name like that, just kind of as a joke. I used to actually interact with that guy way back before he really got big. Um, so, all, all those for separate reasons. Uh, what is my favorite TV soundtrack? That's actually interesting. And I actually debated that one quite a while, because my first thought was Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and then I realized there's only one song I ever remember from that, and that's the intro. <laughs> I don't think it counts at that point. And so I really started thinking about it. What TV show had a soundtrack that I really enjoyed throughout the duration of the show? And so I'm going to have to give this one as a tie between Farscape and Babylon 5, because Babylon 5 really had good mood music, really had good, you know, tone music. Farscape did the same thing, but it was always very subtle. It was always very understated, except when it needed to be bombastic, in which case it was. So for those two separate reasons, I'd say those two. Favorite movie soundtrack. Now, that's a tough one. I'm very, very big on movie music. I think music is one of the key elements of a movie. And uh, I'd have to take this. This is kind of a tie between several. The Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, the Lord of the Dr Rings trilogy in its entirety. So I guess that technically puts us up here. 
and uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy, or quadrology, but really the trilogy. Uh, all of those are definite top-notch for me, music that I absolutely adore and listen to regularly. So, uh, Do I have some passion for cars or car games? Yes, I do. And uh, Oh, and someone also asked if I'm rooting, anyone for, for rooting for anyone for the, the race that was tonight, that was earlier tonight. So I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, one of my biggest problems is I have really difficulty remembering names in general. This is a, this is true in general. For some reason, proper names just don't click with me. And so I have trouble se enthusing with people who are into cars, you know, about cars, because I say, well, you know, that one car, which is this and this and that. And, and this is just kind of how it comes out, because I can't think of the name of the car. And, um... You know, if you ask me what's my favorite car, oh, the Lotus Elise 111R. I can say that right off the top of my head because it's been my favorite car for so many years because I have, you know, always loved that car and I've I forced that, forced that name into my brain. But anything past that, I really have to think about, you know, the MP4-12C or the, the you know, the DB9 and, and so forth and so on. I also have a particular fondness for the, for the Zonda R. I had to think about that one. See, see this is my exact problem. But I do enjoy car games as well, quite a bit. Gran Turismo is one of my favorite series. Uh, I played the unholy heck out of Gran Turismo 4 back in the PS2. I didn't get as much uh, mileage out of Gran Turismo 5. It disappointed me in a few ways, but I did enjoy the fact that they actually had the Top Gear test track on there. Uh, and to answer the second question, uh, who am I really rooting for this year in Formula One? That's actually kind of a tough one. Who I root for tends to vary. It's really, I, I don't dislike anyone on the track except for two people who I'm not going to name. But I I have to say, if I really had to sit down and pick, it would be either between Kimi Raikkonen or uh, Jensen Button. And I would really love to see either of them take home the world championship this year. But past that, I also really like Perez. You know, Maldonado, Alonso has been doing fantastic this year, so props to him. Um, let's see who else. There was a... Uh, because the problem is, I, I just want to list the whole the whole list, you know. I mean, my goodness, you know, Kobayashi has been doing really well, and... Uh, the entire, the entire, uh, God, I'm, I, once again, I'm having name trouble here. Let's just summarize. I like them all, but I'd have to pick Kimi Raikkonen or Button if I had to pick that, so let's move on here. Have I ever heard of a game called Nexus Jupiter, Jupiter Incident? Uh, yes, I did hear about it. It was a decent, good, uh, decently good game. I didn't really, it didn't really wow me. You know, it didn't really leap out at me, but I did enjoy going through it. There is a supposedly a sequel coming out this year, which is interesting, and I'm, I'm really curious to see what they'll do with that, so, you know, we'll see. Uh, have I ever played the Splinter Cell series? Yes, I have. I've never really enjoyed the Splinter Cell series, and I can't really put my finger on why. It's not a bad series, if you know what I mean. You know, I, I wouldn't be like, oh, it's garbage. You know, no, 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 no. It's just something that I just play, and it's like, okay. And I don't know how to explain it. I think it's just something with me, because it never really feels like... Like it has a focus, if you if you could follow me, it never really feels like it has a real, like okay, anybody who's ever played Thief, uh, way back in in the I guess it's not actually that long ago, but you know Thief was an excellent example of how to do stealth gameplay properly, and I always sort of wanted Splinter Cell to be like that, and it never really felt like that to me, especially since there is a degree of action element too, so it's it kind of like felt like playing as the uh, SAS in the in Call of Duty uh, Four whenever I was going through it, and, and I don't know, it, it never really quite caught me, so I, I apologize, but, you know, one of these days I wouldn't mind going through the series as a whole, especially since I haven't played it in several years. But moving along, uh, will I review Half-Life and Half-Life 2? Yes. Uh, do I think they'll announce Half-Life 3 at all? This is an interesting question, and I'm actually going to go over this in a little bit of detail here. One of the things I believe in strongly is not announcing things from an advertising perspective, from a marketing perspective, not advertising things until you're basically good to go. Uh, for example, if I was theoretically working on a video that I've been working as a collaboration with one of my other people, I wouldn't talk about that until I was ready to actually be done with it, you know, because I, I, for obvious reasons, I don't want to get everyone's hopes up about something that I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to complete. You know, same thing, if I was working on an MMO, I wouldn't say, hey, we're working on MMO, and then spend the next six years working on the MMO. I just disagree with that from, for various reasons. And one of the biggest reasons is the longer the wait, the more of an uphill battle you're going to have once the game comes out, because anticipation only lasts so long, and hype only stretches so far until it just starts to dip. And the fact that Half-Life 2 was awesome, yeah, Half-Life 2, Half-Life 2 Episode 1, yeah, Half-Life 2 Episode 2, yeah, cliffhanger ending, and that was how many years ago now? And nothing, nothing ever since then. And the longer they wait, the worse it's going to get, and the greater the expectation is going to be. And so they are literally shooting themselves in the foot. They are going to have to put more time in 
the longer it gets in order to come up with uh, to make up for that. So whether or not they'll announce them doing it again or not, I actually think they won't. If they're smart, what they'll do is they'll wait till Half-Life 3 is ready, and then they'll say, okay, because by that, because of the fact that there's been this gap, there's the possibility that it could dip rather than having hype, rather than having anticipation, people just kind of give up on it. And then, oh, well, okay, we, we finished it. Here it is. That I think could work, but that's just me. What do I think about Paradox Interactive? I hate to t uh, comment on a company with so many teams that do so many different kind of game types, but uh, I do love several of their titles. Uh, some come to mind. Galactic Civilizations is an excellent game, one of my favorite uh, 4X games of the more modern era. Uh, what else was there? Diplomacy. They did Magicka. I enjoyed Magicka a lot. I still play it every now and again with my friends, and both seriously to actually get somewhere and, you know, just killing each other randomly because it's fun. And I, I would call them basically... Uh, other than those three, I would basically call them popcorn games, if that makes any sense. And I don't mean that as a negative thing. I mean it as a game I don't actually involve myself in. I don't immerse myself in, like, something more long-term, like, you know, any of the Elder Scrolls series or, you know, the Mass Effects or the Dragon Ages or the Final Fantasies or anything like that. But it is something that I enjoy just playing through, just to play a game. You know, like Supreme Ruler and Restaurant Empire are two excellent examples of that. And so... You know, I really get into that sort of thing, and I do like the fact that those games exist. I do want those games to exist. I do want to keep playing games like that. Do I have a formal education on literary works? Uh, no, I do not. I took a very wide variety of classes in college. Music, uh, cooking, coding, literature, classical literature, classical music, uh, composition, creative design, artistic works, um, physical fitness. Y you name it, basically, for reasons that I'm not going to bore any of you with. But... What I have done ever since is something my mother always encouraged me, and that is to think and to really analyze, to really figure out the why rather than just the what. And so I do spend a lot of time thinking about things. I do spend a lot of time analyzing. It actually drives some of my friends crazy. You know, we'll get out of a movie, and I'll be talking about the movie in the car on the way home, and they're just and my friend Gary is just like, yep, movie was good. Yep, that's it. <laughs> I've gotten to the point where I don't do that anymore, obviously, but because it just drove him batty, and I don't want to do that. And I do apologize if I drive any of you crazy, because, you know, I, I do overanalyze, and I admit this, but that is how I am, and that's how I've developed this interest in everything, to be, uh, to put it as, as literally as I can. Um, what do I think of Stargate as a whole? This, I, I, by the way, a lot of these questions, if you're wondering why they're phrased differently, it's because I shrunk them down a bit, uh, for the most part. Stargate, the movie I enjoyed, uh, I never had the time to watch the TV show back when it was coming out. I did like the episodes I saw, especially for MacGyver. I can't think of the actor's name, but the guy who played MacGyver, you know, he was awesome. What I do think is that they shouldn't have canceled it. I do think it had promise, and I don't think they should have canceled uh, Atlantis, and I don't think they should have canceled the universe. And they did it in a really crummy way. The, what sci-fi tends to do, for anybody who doesn't know, is they'll let you know you're canceled, like, right at the deadline of when you're about to end the series or season or whatever. And so you don't have time to do anything about it. It's just, oh, by the way, the series has been canceled. Uh, you know, they did the same thing to Farscape. And it's crummy, and it sucks, and I wish they wouldn't do that. And I really think Stargate deserved better than that, personally. But moving on. Uh, what are my thoughts on the older Call of Duty games, such as 1 and 2? You know, I've never actually played Call of Duty 1 through 3. <laughs> Can you believe that? Uh, I have always meant to, and I actually own them. You know, I, I've purchased them since then. I just never actually had the time to go back and do them, which is funny considering how short Call of Duty games tend to be, but it's just never been on my list. But I really would like to go back and see where the series came from, see how it developed. You know, it's like going through the Final Fantasy series, for example. You know, you go, you play, let's just pick out FF10, uh, rather popular one, or FF7, you know, two of the most mainstream of the FFs. You go back and you watch the series progress from FF1 and on, it's just like, whoa. You know, the potential is definitely there. You can see the, the creative work. You can see the, the creative minds working behind it. But it's so limited because of the time and the technology and the money, and so it's interesting to me. So I, I will like to do that someday. Do I remember Archon? Yes, I do. For any of you who haven't uh, heard of that, there was a pseudo-chess game, which is actually much more complicated than that to explain, which I played on the Apple II. Uh, it was amusing at the time, but as, as all games were back then were, but <laughs> and this is going to sound horrible, all I remember thinking at the time with all those games like that was, God, this is it? <laughs> I need more! Oh, come on, more! But um, there is an Archon 2 they came out with. I never actually played that one because that series never really uh, attached to me, but, you know. What is my opinion of Obsidian Entertainment? Now, this is interesting because the gentleman asking this mentioned how they have sort of a bad rap and some of the games uh, they put out get negative reviews. I have no idea why that is, to be completely honest. Um, while they do have buggy issues, because Obsidian doesn't know how to make a game, what Obsidian does know how to do is make a story, and they do it 
beautifully. KOTOR 2 was extremely well written, in my opinion. The only problem with it was the ending, and that wasn't Obsidian's fault, as anybody who knows the story. You know, the fact that they were chopped off at the end and they had to cut content was not Obsidian's fault. I don't fault them that in the tiniest little bit. The fact that uh, Neverwinter Nights 2 sort of had that chop off ending was something they resolved. They, that was a successful saving throw on their part with, with um, Mask of the Betrayer. That was it. And so... You know, Fallout New Vegas, again, a game that had tremendous bug issues right at the launch, but they fixed those. And so in all of these cases, I really did enjoy these games, and these are games I would consider among my favorites. Uh, you know, way up there, maybe not quite in the art, I think KOTOR 2 would qualify as art of these. But at the very least, they're the category right below art, which would be, you know, very good games. Excellent games, that's what we'll call that, excellent games. And so, I don't understand why they get such a bad rap, to be completely honest with you, because I'm completely on board with the idea one thing I wouldn't mind doing is what Obsidian does, is take an existing game engine, take an existing s setup like that, and make your own game out of it, because I don't, I'm not, I'm too out of date with code. You know, all the coding uh, that I did was, was long ago. I understand the concepts, of course. I could do, I could map code. I could get a piece of graph paper and say this is how it has to work, and I understand how it functions. But I couldn't actually sit down and type it out, if you know what I mean. I don't know what's, what's, what's changed in the coding world as far as the actual functions anymore. I'm too out of date. And so what I could do is sit down and say, okay, here's the engine. Let's do something with that. I could do that, and I would love that kind of job. You know, just sit down and write stories. And I do think Obsidian writes very good stories. I do put my stamp on, on all of the Obsidian games that I can think of right off the top of my head because they do excellent stories. And I really got into them. So... Ah, uh, this person asked me if I would expand on my feelings for Star Trek Holodex. Now, I'm not 100% sure I understand the question in depth, but I think he's referring to what I was referring as far as the Holodex having an actual AI and adaptability. One of the things I have argued since forever, since TNG, is that the holodeck has genuine artificial intelligence, borderline sentience, if not actual sentience, behind it. And the reason is because it has a degree of adaptability that is basically impossible to do without the kinds of what-if statements that would stretch unto the infinity. The fact that it can adapt to basically anything with the programs that are in it, and the fact that you can walk in and say, Computer! Table! And just, it'll pop a table out based on that one sentence. Anyone who understands anything about code, anyone who understands anything about a computer program at all, will understand that saying computer table and having a table popped out is insane. <laughs> That's, however, if you had a person who just had the ability to make things happen like that, you know, like a Q or whatever in this example, and you said table and he snapped his finger like that, that wouldn't even make you bat your eyelashes because... He's a person, he has sentience, he can think, he can adapt like that. And then you say, no, 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 make it burgundy. There we go, burgundy, you know. And um, that kind of adaptability, I want to expand on this just a little bit, because I've heard a lot of people say rather uh, things I don't want to talk about, about the holodeck, about what they would use it for. <clears throat> but I've never felt that way personally. Maybe it's just because I'm boring, I don't know. <laughs> But me and several of my friends, uh, especially my closest friends, the people I consider my true friends, you know what we'd really like to do with Holodeck? Go in and play Fallout, for example. Imagine the ability to actually hop into Fallout, the Fallout universe, and play Fallout 1 a actually there, you know? Imagine the ability to go through Final Fantasy VI. Imagine the ability to go through all of the Elder Scrolls, you know, from, from all the way back in Arena up to Skyrim. Wouldn't that be amazing? And because it's so adaptable... Because there's a true AI there, as I mentioned, you could divert the story, and you could actually see what would happen. One of the things I used to talk about, what I would love to try, is, for example, because this isn't just limited to games, what if I hop, wanted to hop in a TV show and play one of the, the characters in that? Let me use my favorite example, this Star Trek Voyager, a show that overall was disappointing, but was still enjoyable at times, but had so much potential. So what if I hopped in and said, all right, computer... Uh, give me Star Trek Voyager, but I want you to change this and this and this and this to make it actually make sense. And the computer's like, you got it, because sentience. And then I could play Star Trek Voyager, Voyager the correct edition, if you follow me. And that would be fantastic. You know, to use something more recent, Mass Effect 3, the perfect edition. I could play that in a holodeck. And that level of creative freedom is mind-boggling. It's Minecraft to the nth degree. In, in every direction, if you understand what I'm saying by that. 
And so I think that would be both fantastic and terrible. And of course the reason why it would be terrible is the obvious question, why do anything real if you can do it in the holodeck? But that's a, that's a conversation I'm not going to get into just yet. So next question, uh, will I do a Farscape review? Um, my response to this is basically the same as my Babel, my request for Babylon 5 reviews. I, I don't know. I never really thought about doing a review of, of a TV show like that. Farscape is an excellent show, and I wouldn't mind doing that, but if, if I was going to do that, I'd probably do it in a different manner, or just review Farscape as a whole, or like per season, if you know what I mean. One video per season. Really don't know. I've, I've, I'm still leaving that kind of over there in the maybe pile, because I, I don't know. Something I haven't thought about that much. Uh, what do I think about Elder Scrolls Online? Good question. <sighs> Let's be honest here. Um, I've actually kind of talked about this a, r a little bit already, but as it has been pointed out, Bethesda themselves, the actual team, is not actually making Elder Scrolls Online. I, I wasn't actually aware of this, and I can explain why very briefly. In Skyrim, there were there were quite a few hints that Skyrim was being built with the intent that that would be geared towards multiplayer. That engine would be used in multiplayer aspect. You know, there's multiplayer code underneath the the, the redesign of the freezing of the world. I'll, I'll go into these things in detail when I actually do my Skyrim review. But the point is, there was a lot of hints that they were already ramping up to multiplayer. So when they started, the rumors started floating around, it didn't surprise me at all, because I already assumed they were already working on it. And I was right. Just, also, I was completely wrong. <laughs> Maybe they will be saying that using the same engine. I'm not sure. But let's be completely honest here. Elder Scrolls Online is probably something I'll pick up, and is probably something I'll play. It is probably not something I'll play long term. It will not be a new Asheron's Call. It will not be a new World of Warcraft. It will probably... Guild Wars 2 is the other one that is most likely going to be a long-term one for me. I can't say that yet because it's not out yet. But it's probably going to be an MMO I play through and then put down, as many have been, like Lotro, for example, or Tor. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, and, you know, it's just... it's its own thing. So, moving on. What do I think about Legends of Grimrock? This is an interesting concept. I've never actually got into dungeon crawling games that are just dungeon crawling, as weird as that sounds from a fan of the Diablo series. But it does look a lot like the old Ultima series, back on the, the NES or the PC or the Amiga or whatever you played it on. And while that's an interesting style, it's just not my thing personally. I do think they did a very good job with Legends of Grimrock, and I'm actually really glad that they're doing something like that. As I mentioned way back in the beginning, the idea that, you know, they will try a game like that I think is fantastic, and I do, I do wish them success on it. And I also pointed it out to a friend of mine who uh, who really did enjoy the old Ultima series and that kind of game and really is looking forward to it and probably will be picking up Legend of Grimrock. Uh, um, and I quote, So you're working on an MMO. Why did you just try to make a different game with the same team? Was it money or time? Uh, both. <laughs> but part of the problem was the feasibility of it just kind of fell through. And we never actually succeeded at getting funding you know, the concept of indie games wasn't really around at the time. This was several years ago, obviously several, several years ago. And the, the idea of independent publishing was just unlikely. And so we needed budgeting. We needed people to invest. And uh, that was mostly my job. I was dealing with all the business aspects of the, co of the setup. And I had scared together some investment. And all of them were investing in an MMO. And the MMO market changed so what, drastically and violently that not only was it not going to work, and we probably wouldn't, weren't actually going to make a return on investment, maybe. Kind of depends. That's, that's a dice roll at that point. But the uh, investors kind of le left because the market changed. So that would be why. Um, what do I think of Minecraft? I actually did a Minecraft review. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's still up. I should probably go check that at some point. But anyways, I still have the Minecraft review up somewhere? Who's messaging me? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Work-related. Okay, but ultimately, if you want me to give you a one-sentence description, I think Minecraft is an excellent creative tool and a terrible game. I would never play Minecraft if it was just the game. You know, just the zombies on and all that stuff, because that's just irritating to me, as, as honest as I can be about it, and has no real point to it. But I do love the creative aspect of it, both with creative mode on, where you just box wherever, and where you have to actually gather the resources yourself. I do enjoy that concept of go and find resources and try and build something, but build something with limitations, which is a, which is an engineering problem, if you know what I'm talking about. You know, an engineer is not given infinite budget and infinite resources to make a bridge. He is given this, make a bridge out of this, and that's what Minecraft does in that mode, and I like that. I enjoy that. So, have I seen the Avengers? No, not yet. I will be. Uh, opinions on the fact that the Avengers and the Marvel's continuity is being brought to the world of film. I think it's awesome. 
I think it is about time, in all honesty. I think they should have done this before now. And I am very glad that the Marvel movies tend to be... are going on an upswing. I do credit Joss Whedon for at least part of this. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. But um, I will also say that, you know, it's, it's not like the... What I want is not to ever see X-Men 3 again. That was such a travesty. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I try to be understanding. I try to be tolerant. X-Men 3 was garbage. And so, in my opinion. And so... I hope that I never see that again. I hope this this trend of Marvel movies that are actually good or at least tolerable continue. So, what are your favorite films, or more specifically, what are the films you would put in the art tier way up here? Now that's an interesting question. I think I've asked answered this before to some extent, but I would put the original trilogy of Star Wars in there instantly without question. I would put uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy in there with instantly and without question. I would put Pirates of the Caribbean three in there and one, not two. Um, Two was certainly good, and it had its purpose, and it had its point. It was enjoyable, but it was not art, in my opinion. Three, someone asked me once, why do I think Pirates of the Caribbean 3 was art? The first five minutes of it, the intro to it, is all I really have to say on that. That was so well done, and that was just, that was spine-chilling in the best way. Oh, my God. Just remembering it is just, oh, you know. Um, and there are some older films in there as well, which I won't go into. My list of films is actually gargantuan. But uh, let's just skip over that for now. Um, have I played Bastion? I think that was asked before, and I, I think I missed over it. Oh, no, it was... Okay. But anyways, no, I have not. Uh, it is on my Steam wish list. I do plan on picking it up someday. It looks really interesting, and it looks like the kind of game I would like to support, which is, you know, even if I didn't actually have the time to play it, I would like to buy it just to say, yes, keep doing this, please, here's my money, yes. Here is my drop in the bucket to help continue encouraging you to do this kind of thing, so, you know... Um, scroll down a bit to the next page. What are your thoughts on the Devil May Cry reboot? Now, I am cautiously hopeful about this. Anytime a third-party developer gets working on an existing series, it's basically a coin toss in my experience. It will either be really good and be a really good take on it, or it will be terrible. And, um, that's really all that it comes down to. And so I'm really hoping for the really good, and what I've seen looks promising, but I hesitate to put any uh, labeling on that, excuse me. So, we'll see. I'm hoping for, you know, more of a Super Mario RPG than I am a, uh, uh, what's a good example of the, uh, Metroid Other M, which, while it was at least a tolerable game, let's be honest, was not a Metroid game. <laughs> so, moving on. Uh, have I played Torchlight? Yes, I have. What, now this was phrased interestingly. It was actually a rather long question. I tried to simplify it. What would be worth switching to from Torchlight? Because the ge gentleman in question just picked up Torchlight. Torchlight is an excellent dungeon crawler uh, D2 type game with, and, and this is actually interesting because I played Torchlight once through and then I never picked it up again because the story was very threadbare and there wasn't a lot keeping me going other than the continuing loot and uh, dungeon crawling cycle. And as I've mentioned just a bit ago, just plain dungeon crawling isn't something that I really get into. Not, you know, anything that has no achievement and no accomplishment to it is something I personally have a problem with, as I'll discuss uh, whenever I get to Mass Effect 3. But uh, the point here is that Torchlight was an excellent first time through and I did buy it, you know, obviously, I guess. And I did encourage several friends to buy it, and I am purchasing Torchlight 2. The question, is there anything worth dropping Torchlight for? That's a toughie. In my personal opinion, I do think Diablo 3 is superior to Torchlight. But that is just my opinion, and it is also partially steeped in the fact that Diablo 3 has more story to it, more development, more flavor, more characterization. And if you just want dungeon crawling, if that's just what you're after, honestly, I would say stick with Torchlight and go ahead and just pick up Torchlight 2 when it comes out. Because Torchlight has... It is a lot more accessible when it comes to that, especially the infinite dungeon, whose name I can't even think of right now, but you know what I'm talking about, the one in the lower right of the town there. So that, that's my recommendation on that one. Uh, would I develop a game if I had a team if I had a team and creative control over it? This is also an interesting question. So many interesting questions this day. This is actually really cool. I like this. Um, yes, I guess tentatively. Let, let me explain myself here really quick. If I was to make a game, or games, or book, or books, or TV shows, I would want to do it regardless of the money, if that makes any sense at all. And let me, let me try to explain myself here. I would want to be able to throw away money to make it better. 
I would want to be able to hemorrhage money. That's actually the term, literally, from an economic term. I would want to hemorrhage my budget in order to make it better, in order to improve it, in order to really, really put myself in it, really put the team into it, really put the effort into it, and say, yes, go, man. And I would love, and I would be there, you know, 16 hours a day. Yes, come on, we need to do this. Burn the midnight oil every night. Because... <sighs> Being completely honest, uh, I, I, I've always viewed money as kind of a necessary evil. I understand it, obviously. Uh, accounting is another thing I took back in college, by the way. I, I won an award for accounting um, and business and entrepreneurship and economic. I, I did a lot of that stuff. Anyways, it's, a, it's almost a necessary evil because if I'm honest, if I'm completely honest with myself or, or whoever's asking the question, which I guess is the 2,000 people watching me right now, what I would want is to do it as though money didn't exist. And so I want... I, not making a game to sell, making a game to share, if that makes any sense at all. Making a game that I want to be an obvious... a work of passion, you know, a work of love, a work of really putting myself out there, really showing, you know, this this is me and this is all my effort and this is all my time and all my effort and, and the effort of my team and all these people, because, I, you know, I don't work in a vacuum. I've said that a lot. I, I refuse to work in a vacuum. I, I don't trust myself like that. So, you know, this is us. Here is our game, and it, it is hopefully awesome. And if it was awesome, then great. And and as I've said before, if even one person came to me and said, you know, Arshan Gaia, your game was amazing. It made, it brought me to tears. It was wonderful. I would consider that a success. And I would probably lose money on it. And I'd be totally okay with that. And that would be the truth for anything. I actually thought about doing a TV show some years ago. The reason it did I didn't do it was because it would not be to make money, and that's what you make a TV show to do, so... Uh, let's see, moving on. Um, are you a fan of comics? If you are, do you have a favorite writer or series? Uh, yes and no. I have a phrase that I use amongst myself and my friends who are also comic book readers. We call it, depends on the writer. And, you know, it's like saying, I like Superman, depending on the writer. Or, I like, you know, to use an obvious example, uh, I like Green Lantern, depending on the writer. I like, you know... <laughs> It just kind of goes like that. I like, I like Iron Man, depending on the writer, because it really does depend. When you have so many people writing for a single character, you're going to have different variations, and so I tend to subscribe uh, to you know certain interpretations of the characters, and so I tend to only like the writers who write them that way. I can't name any specifics off the top of my head because I don't remember names. I do apologize. Uh, the, the main guy who does uh, the Green Lantern series is one I do enjoy. Uh, he tends to be fairly consistent, actually. And uh, as far as series as I do, I do enjoy Green Lantern, obviously. I do enjoy some X-Men. I just enjoyed some X-Men. It's actually been a while since I've really gotten into X-Men. Um, God, what else? Spider-Man. I've always been a big fan of Spider-Man. Uh, well, not always. Again, depends on the writer. But, you know, I am actually into quite a few comics, believe it or not. It's just not something I'm into very much. It's right up there with, like, say, Warhammer 40K. Something I do enjoy, something I do know a great deal about, and something I can discuss at length. But I wouldn't call it a passion for me, if you understand what I mean here. So it's something I engage with with that one guy over there who's my one friend who likes that. And I engage with, with these three guys who, you know, you get my point here. Uh, next question. Have I ever read the Song of Fire and Ice series? No, I haven't. Um, this is going to sound really weird. I don't actually usually enjoy fantasy games. Or fantasy games, wow. Fantasy books. Um, I'm actually really particular about books in general, and most of the books I do enjoy I tend to prefer uh, sci-fi. But I, I am aware of Song of Fire and Ice. I know a decent deal about it, obviously, and, you know, it is a very wi widely, widely white, well-acclaimed series. I'm going to have to take a drink here soon. So, you know, nothing bad to say about it, just not something I ever got into. And I'm going to go and take that drink now. Ah. What do I think of the angry video game nerd? He's not my thing. Uh, I don't like the excess of cussing, uh, especially in that kind of format. You know, cussing in, in length can be done properly. It, it's actually kind of hard to explain how to do that properly, to be honest with you. There's a, there's, a, there's a balance there of not doing it too much but not doing it too little. That can, that can actually still be amusing. But I don't, I don't really care for his format, partially because it is completely staged. <laughs> you know, I've seen his outtakes, I've seen him in his development. And I actually find his outtakes more enjoyable than I do his actual show. But he does make some interesting points, and he does, you know, come at it full head, and I do give him some little level of credit for at least talking about it straight rather than trying to, mm. you know, or pull the IGN thing, or the GameStop thing, or GameSpot. Sorry, I always get those confused. Uh, do I have any advice for any new and hopeful game reviewers like myself? God, I don't know. Um, 
My advice, honestly, is basically what I did. Uh, I never expected to be big, as I think I've said several times. I never expected these to actually take off and people to actually start watching these uh, like they did with the Mass Effect 3 one video I put out. My biggest, my best advice would be to find a niche, find a style, a format for how you do it. You know, I do the talking head thing here with my webcam, and and stick with it and work and you know just work with it, polish it. You know, you know, I, I've been trying to get better at these. You know, I'm trying to get my setup better. I, I don't have enough. Uh, money right now to go ahead and get a 720p camera, for example, but I've been thinking about it. You know, I take the notes, I do the thing, I make the sound so I can e be easier to see and easier to hear, all that fun stuff. I'm thinking about doing a podcast. So just just polish it, just work in it over time and try and get better and hopefully be more enjoyable for the audience. Um, scroll down a bit again. Have I ever played Blood Omen 2, Legacy of Cain? Yes, I have la played the Legacy of Cain series, as I mentioned in my Dragon Age review. Uh, at least briefly, or uh, scans. It is an excellent series. I really wish they'd continue it, and I do enjoy, uh, do intend to replay it sometime soon. I don't know when. When I have time, you know, whenever that'll be. But I would like to replay it sometime in the future. It is enjoyable, so I really do recommend it for anyone who's in that ki into that kind of game, especially because the story, the plot of the series, let's just say it's a lot more intricate than it looks at first, and leave it at that. Um, what do I see as the future of Tor going forward? Being honest, I only see two possibilities for Tor. Uh, one is that it will find its own little niche, it will find its own little corner uh, of gamers and, and of consumer base who continue to play it and will make money off of them sufficiently to continue to support it. A good example of that type of thing would be Lotro. Lotro has been, you know, over there in the corner, it's not very widely publicized, it's not very, it doesn't have a huge chunk of the market share, but it still makes money and it still has its own little corner of the, of the market over there that it just kind of keeps to itself. And, you know, good on them, good for that. So that is my hope, is what, that, that's the, that's the positive way Tor could go, and I do actually kind of hope they do that, because I would like to go back to Tor someday uh, with a friend of mine who never actually picked it up for various reasons, and, you know, play it through, you know, one more time, maybe two more times, I don't know, probably just the one, to be honest with you. The other possibility is Tor will go the way of Earth and Beyond, because the circumstances are nearly identical to what happened with Earth and Beyond. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, because I've only ranted about this like 17,000 times, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm still upset about this, still, after all these years. Earth and Beyond was a fantastic MMO. I really enjoyed it. It was something interesting and unique and innovative, and I loved it. And EA said, well, we know you're making net profit, but you're not making enough. So you're, you're canceled. We're shutting down the MMO, and we're diverting all your resources over here. That was actually when they officially shut Westwood down, too. That was the last game done under the Westwood label. <sighs> so it is extremely likely that they will shut down Tor and distribute them, and that will be the last game under the Bioware label, such as it was. Any, you know, Obviously, the Bioware name will continue just as the Westwood name continued, but Westwood and Bioware will cease to exist as actual you know, cohesive units. Like I said, the situations are very identical, and it's actually very likely that that is what's going to happen. I hope not, so we'll see. In Civilization Five, what are your top five uh, top five favorite civilizations and why? That's an interesting question. Uh, my top would probably be Russian because I myself am uh, primarily Russian descent. Uh, even though my my, my accent, which I almost slipped into for a second there, is actually uh, Romanian. But moving on, um, I would also say. French is one of my favorite civs, uh, usually because I like a challenge and it's an interesting early start, late, you know, late stop kind of kind of a setup. I like the uh, Egyptians for obvious reasons, the construction, and I like the Romans again, building construction, and finally the Persians. I want to say it's the ones who have the extended duration on uh, Golden Ages. I think it's the Persians. I'm actually not 100 percent sure, but if you know which one I'm talking about, you know which one it is. And for those reasons, because you know. The Golden Age strategy is one that I could pull up very well and just have the Eternal and Golden Age once you set it up properly and get the dominoes going. In Civilization V, do I have a preferred victory method or do I mix it up? Oh, I mix it up all the time. Uh, I have no preferred victory method at all. It completely depends on my mood. Most of my games last several days as because uh, thanks to Civ V is wonderful about this because you have the Steam Cloud for that. So I could play it here or I could play it at my friends or I could play it at my tower at home. You know, wherever I am, I will tend to have a game going. In fact, I have a game going right now. As, uh, as Russia, where I'm just doing my thing and uh, expanding, economically speaking, and, you know, based on my mood, uh, try and win in my own particular ma manner. And it also depends on my mood whether or not I want to just play idly, you know, crank the difficulty down, or if I really want to challenge, crank the difficulty up, or if I just want to play normally, you know, put it in the middle. 
I vary a lot. It really depends on my mood at the time, at the specific moment. It's one of the things I like about the Civilization games, and then that type of game in general, is you can do that sort of thing. You know, play it depending on your mood. I love that. Uh, next question. What, speaking of Civ 5 again, what features would you like most like to be added in future installments expansions? That's an interesting question. Uh, I would say... <sighs> I like the idea of separate tech trees. It's a concept not very many 4X games have pulled off. I actually can't even think of one right off the top of my head. But a lot of other things that I can name specifically, uh, terrain modification. If any of you played Alpha Centauri, uh, arguably one of my favorite 4X games of all time, that's an excellent example of terrain modification and no, not only being able to use that to help your cities, but to be able to use that offensively. I had a whole faction I'd custom built called the Terraformers, whose only powers were their abilities around terraforming, and I could win army, you know, I could win wars with terraforming. It was awesome. I would also love to see more scenario support. It's one of the things that Civ 2 really had over all other Forex games I've ever played ever, was the level of scenario support, the level of scripting you could do. Basically, they gave the, the players the access to the game at the game engine and said here make whatever and so you could you know you could play the eastern front in world war ii fully scripted and it was fantastic and i loved it so something like that would be awesome uh, i guess that's it really that's all i got um someone here ah yes i, I made a point of this because someone named cg i'm actually not sure how to pronounce c guevara 12 uh asked me something in chinese <laughs> <laughs> so for any of you who aren't aware of what he asked, he asked, what are you thinking of the gaming community? Uh, what do you think it's a negative thing overall or not? Uh, yes and no. For example, this community right here, the one that has just kind of grown up uh, around these videos and around the Mass Effect issue, uh, has one that is overall supportive, one that's overall positive, that I am uh, you know, pleased to be a member of, and I actually do like you know, hanging out with in my own little way. And one of the reasons I continue to do these Q&As with some level of enthusiasm is because I, I like being a part of this community. And so there are positive aspects that, you know, for example, in, in World of Warcraft, there's a, a massive number of, uh, of different communities, of different groups, even within the one server that you're on. But at the same time, even amongst that, there's, you know, the groups that you really enjoy hanging out with, and then there's the people you just want to have absolutely nothing to do with. So it's a very yes or no uh, answer for me. It's very depends on the circumstances. I think overall, the gaming community is no real different than any other community when it comes to that aspect, because you have the people who are self-entitled twats, if you'll excuse my language, and then you have the people who are just ignorant, for good and for bad, and then you have the people who are just trying to do their own thing, and you have the people who are trying to help and support each other, and everything else on the, on the spectrum, really, in going about directions. So it's very much a, a grab bag. Next question. Have you ever played Planescape Torment? God, yes, of course I have. That is a fantastic game. I love that game. I just realized I could hook this on my shirt and not have this cable dangling around all the time. I love Planescape Torment. Uh, it is an absolutely amazing game. I need to get another copy of it and replay it soon. And by another copy, I mean my copy is having trouble playing. Because Windows 7 and the usual issue with older games, and anybody who's done that knows what I'm talking about. So I really would like to play that again probably soon. I've been in the mood for that lately, you know, within the last few months, especially after Mass Effect 3. So, wonderful game. I have nothing but good things to say about that. Have I ever heard of rugby? Uh, yes, I have heard of rugby. Not something I enjoy. I did play it a little bit during high school. It was kind of an experimental thing. Uh, it was interesting enough. Not really my, my kick. I'm not really... Uh, into that kind of sports. I don't even know how to explain it really, because, you know, I did like basketball quite a bit. I did enjoy baseball even, for that matter, and I enjoyed soccer and racing I enjoy, obviously, but, you know, past that, it, I don't know, something something just doesn't quite click for me. I understand a decent amount about rugby and about football and about uh, European football <laughs> in order to watch it, in order to enjoy it, but not quite my thing. Uh, what do I think of the Half-Life series and Half-Life 2? Well, that's a big question. Let's go ahead and just give you a quick answer here. I think they are the diamonds in the rough. I think the Half-Life rescued FPS from the Doom, the post-Doom era of Doom. <laughs> Ironically, you know, the uh, Doom was well, Doom was you know great. Uh, Wolfenstein 3D, I actually personally preferred. Doom 2 was all right. Uh, Quake was good. Quake 2 was good. And then, but there was this period there where it was just ugh, there were just so many FPSs that were terrible, and it just got boring. And then finally, half that came out. I was like, huh? Oh my god, Half-Life, you know, oh, Angelic Core. Um, Half-Life 2 was also a very good success. Uh, comparing the two is actually kind of difficult to do. Half-Life 1 certainly had more accomplishment, but Half-Life 2, I think, was a better game, more polished, and uh, had more story to it. But at the same time, you know, I, I'm not going to go into the more. I'm going to stop here, because I could go into that for a while. 
So let's just say thumbs up, and then another thumbs up, and if I had another thumb, I'd be putting that up too. Lots of props. Now, next question. What is your favorite color? White. Next question. <laughs> What's your favorite color? Red, blue, or green? Uh, my, my favorite color in that case is turning off the game and, and walking away. See you guys! No, no, okay. Um... <laughs> What are my thoughts on 3D? Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, I just copy this, copy paste here. What are my thoughts on 3D? Are you for game developers and tech companies making more and more stuff in 3D, or do you prefer stuff to stay in 2D? And finally, do you th see the future of tech moving completely to 3D? Now this is referring to the 3D uh, glasses, not the actual 3D rendering uh, polygons kind of thing, for anyone who was confused. Uh, in my opinion, it's a gimmick. Uh, there's been a lot of gimmicks in, in entertainment in general, but especially in video gaming over the years, and a lot of people just kind of forget how many of them we've already gone by. Anyone remember the Power Glyph? Um, so I think it's just another gimmick. I think it's something that I hope doesn't go anywhere. You know, 3D has been getting kind of silly, in my opinion. I don't like 3D. I refuse to watch a movie in 3D. I refuse to watch, you know, buy a 3D television, for example, or anything like that. And the only time I have ever seen 3D implemented properly, ever, was on the 3DS. And even then, it's one of those things that's like ice, not even icing on the cake. It's like the few chocolate pieces that you put on the icing on the cake. It's nice, but if it wasn't there, it, you'd be fine, and when you're feeling kind of sick because you had too much sugar today, you can just kind of wipe them off and be good. I know that's a weird analogy, but the point I'm getting to here is that the thing I like most about the 3DS is you can turn the 3D off <laughs> as far it, with, with regards to the 3D, because I like that being optional, and I don't get into 3D all the time, especially when I'm doing this thing with a particular game. You know, I don't want that in 3D because then it's just going to be blurring all over the place. So, not my thing. Do not care for that. And uh, hopefully we'll get over this whole 3D craze soon. Do I think Warcraft 3 is an underappreciated title? That's an interesting question. I keep saying that today, don't I? I am sorry. I just feel repetitive today. I apologize, guys. I'm not trying to be repetitive. A lot of these questions have intrigued me, though. I mean that sincerely. I'm not just saying that. That is an interesting question. Uh, yes and no. The reason I say yes is because, in my opinion, Warcraft 3 didn't, didn't and doesn't, for that matter, get nearly the attention that, say, uh, StarCraft did, or Diablo 2, for that matter, or, uh, you know, any, uh, even Command & Conquer had a really big uh, tournament set up back in the day. Anyone remember that? You know, the Command & Conquer uh, tournament games? Those were fun. And at the same time, by the same respect, Warcraft 3 gave us something called Dota, or Defense of the Agents, for they don't know that. And it is interesting to note that most people recognize Dota, or Defense of the Ancients, whereas most people, if I was to say Aeons of Strife, would have no idea what I'm talking about. And for those of you who don't, Aeons of Strife is what actually started that particular genre. And they actually, technically, Mercs and Tex is something that started that. Very few people heard of Mercs and Tex, but both Mercs and Tex and Aeons of Strife were StarCraft maps that really started that whole two AIs and you're playing a hero thing. And then it came into its own in Defense of the Ancients, on uh, Warcraft 3, and that is, of course, exploded all over the place. I mean, we have League of Legends and Dota 2 and all that going on now, so... Yes and no is, is I guess, my answer. Uh, I do think it's a fantastic game, by the way. I just feel like pointing that out. What do I think about the lack of customizable controls in console games when compared to PCs? I really wish they'd, they'd go back or add in that type of thing. I, I'm, I'm a big customization person. I almost never use the default setup, just because I'm, I'm weird, I'm me, and I, liked, I like to have options. And I remember, you know, like uh, older games, you know, like uh, PS1 era, I think is probably the best era for when you really could customize every single control uh, every single, what every single button did, except for a couple, of course. That was nice. I liked that. I really wish modern games would do that more, rather than this is this button, and this is this button, and you can't c switch it around if, if you happen to be disagreeing with it, or if you think it doesn't work like that, or, you know, not, ha not being able to customize camera control, that's another big thing. Really bothers me, because about half of the games do the thing where you tilt the analog left, and the camera goes this way. And then about half of them have where you tilt the cam le analog left, and the camera goes this way. And mentally switching between the two actually becomes irritating because in some cases you can't customize that. You just have to live with left going this way or whatever. So I really wish people would start bringing that back into account. I, I, I really don't see why they don't, to be completely honest with you. It's not a difficult thing to code, and that kind of option is something I think should exist. Next question. Oh my goodness, more water. Uh, did I play FF13 and FF13 Tune 2? Yes, I did. Uh, did I like them? Yes, I did. Uh, if yes, why? And if not, why not? Well, 
as I've said before, I, I listed FF13. I'm, I don't count 13.2 or 10.2 as part of the FF series, by the way, in case anyone's ever wondering about that. But I list 13 as the worst of the Final Fantasy series. But as I've said before, that's not actually a negative comment. That's It, it would be more accurate to say FF13 is my least favorite. It's still a good game. I still enjoyed it. It still had a very engaging story. The graphics were, of course, fantastic. I actually liked the combat system. And one of the things I thought was in its favor, and I'll go into this in more detail later when I get to FF13, was the fact that because you fully heal and fully res, and each what what it is is each combat sequence, each battle is in and of itself. You don't have to take into account uh, you know healing at the end of a fight or how how much mana you have left, anything like that. It's completely segregated, and what that enables the developers to do from a from a design perspective is make the fights more interesting and more difficult and really force you to think more about your tactics on the fly in, in any given fight. And they do this as the game goes on, so, you know, props there. And uh, those would be the reasons why. And then he goes in to say, th there's about a paragraph here, I'm not going to link it all for you here. Link. Talk it all. Say it all. But uh, he asks why I didn't like Hope. Let me explain why I didn't like Hope in, in as briefly as I can. Number one, having a character who has a grudge against someone else, okay, Having that character be the whiniest thing, unkind word, in the universe, not cool. Hope was so whiny. This this is a trend that the FFs have been inching towards uh, for a while, actually. And Titus, yes, it's pronounced Titus, for anybody who's wondering. Ugh. Um, I said Titus for quite a while until I learned the truth. Titus uh, was whiny, but he was still tolerable. In FF12, you had Vaughn. Vaughn was whiny, but, you know, whinier, but still something I could deal with. Hope I just couldn't deal with. He never shut up about it. And it, it just reached the head. I just want to explain this really quick. I'm sorry if I'm taking too long here. Snow was a good person. He was arguably the, the most good guy in all of 13, in my opinion. And, you know, the most good character, if, if you got it, the most heroic, whatever you want to call that. And Hope is upset about him because he failed to save his mother's life for dying in something that is essentially unrelated to him. Yes, he you could argue the semantics that Snow had something to do with her dying, but that's getting, like I said, semantics. In fact, as I uh, like to call that, that is getting into it technically. And if you get into it technically, in my opinion, you're already wrong. So, technically, Snow did have a part in doing in, in her death. Hope needs to let that go and just move on. And it doesn't help that Snow took it upon himself to take care of this kid, to to be there for him and help him and be the elder, you know, big brother slash father figure for this kid who lost his mother because he feels bad about that, because he wants to help him, because he's a good character. And Hope tries to kill him in this one scene, shoves him over a cliff edge, and I just saw that coming from a mile off, and I was like, you're kidding! I wanted to smack him! So... In brief, that would be why I don't like uh, Hope. <clears throat> I could go on about that for a while, but I really don't want to get into that, so let's just move on. <sighs> what would you like to see in Dragon Age 3? I, I've kind of already answered that question, but this guy goes into a little bit more detail. Which party members from the previous two games would I like to return in 3 as companions again, or would it be better if they only return in cameos and we got a new party? I think... Uh, that the latter would be more successful depending on how they take the story. Th this is the problem. It depends on where they take the story. It depends on how it goes. But I could tell you uh, three people right off the top of my head I would like to return as uh, companions in the game. The Warden, Hawk, and uh, Varric. Not only all of those would make perfect sense from a structural and a story perspective, but all of those would be awesome. Next question. Uh, oh, continuing again. What do you think about the protagonist? Should we have Hawk again? Uh, I have no objection. Blah, 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 blah. Do you think it would be great if the new protagonist could be any species, or should it only be human? Uh, I think it should be a completely new protagonist in my, it, from an artistic perspective, from a design perspective. I would do that if I was designing Dragon Age 3. And I would make it be... Uh, well, to be completely honest, I'd make it be the warden and Morgan's child. <laughs> that would, but moving along, you know, that kind of things, a new person. Um, but even ignoring the Morgan and warden's child thing, I would probably lean towards enabling you to make it be any race. I like that idea, especially being a Kunari. That would be awesome being able to play a Kunari. But what they could also do is not is limited a little bit more. Let's say dwarf, elf, uh, Kunari, and say Ferelden or Legion, or uh, Tevinter. How's that for an idea? 
And all the last three, for any who aren't familiar, are all, are all just different nations of humans. But it would be very interesting to see them pull that off, because you know you could have the whole impact on the the, the story be different uh, in certain ways, like Origins did, for example. But anyways, moving on. Uh, what would I uh, speaking of which, continuing with Dragon Age Three? What would I like to see about the story of Dragon Age Three, and which country would I like to see? Now we already are pretty sure we're going to see Orlesia, but I would like to see Orlesia and get more into that. Um, as far as the story goes, I would like to know... I would like them to tie things up. I want to know what the actual truth was behind the Darkspawn. They've been dancing around that issue the whole series. What is the real truth? What actually happened with the Darkspawn? What actually spawned them? What made the Archdemons and all that, you know, all the back in the day? I would like to know what Morgan was so compl worried about. I would not to, like to know what Flemeth actually is and why and what she's after, you know? Really bring things together and... From a stylistic perspective, the best way to do that would be to reveal uh, the man behind the man, which is the TV trope name for it. it. It's essentially the person who is, or the thing, or the entity, or the uh, organization that is actually behind everything that's been going on. And I think that would be suitably epic, especially if they did everything else I just mentioned. But I'm trying not to get my hopes up, to be completely honest with you, because Mass Effect 3 just came out, and I got my hopes way too high on that one. So, moving on. Do I own a PlayStation 3? Yes, I do. Are you familiar with the Uncharted franchise? Yes, I am. Do I play them? Yes, I do. Do I like them? God, yes. Uh, I actually did an, a review of Uncharted 3 some time back, but my synopsis was they are fantastic games, and my only complaint about them is that they are short. They are very enjoyable, very excellent design, and I'm not going to go into detail because I, I mentioned several of that back in my Uncharted review, but I do definitely approve of them and endorse them for anybody who wants to get into them. Um, do I honestly think it is still possible to remedy the injuries of the Mass Effect 3 incident that Bioware caused? Yes, I do. I do think it is possible they'll make a comeback. I do think it is possible they'll prove themselves to be the ex the exception to the EA rule, the law that's been set down for like the last, God, like 22 years now. Um, and it is very possible Dragon Age 3 will be fantastic. It's very possible the DLC will fix the problems we have with it. It's, you know, who knows, you know? I will not automatically say they have they will fail in any future endeavors what i was trying to say in my reviews was that they already failed because of the fact that they had to fix it if you follow me they failed on their existing st status here because it needed fixing that was the failure that does not necessarily mean they will still continue to fail if you follow where i'm going with so i'm i'm you know i'm still willing to give them uh, breath here it's just they need to prove themselves now they don't get any uh, any automatic trust at this point uh, what are my thoughts on the Dead Space series? This is actually a lengthy question, but I narrowed it down to that. The Dead Space series is a, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, it's what I call a shock horror, which isn't, which is, uh, there needs to be a different name for that, but it's like, uh, I'm trying to think of a movie example here off the top of my head. I got nothing. Whatever. The point is, it's very startle horror, it's very violent, it's very gory, it's very, you know, right in your face. Uh, and for all these reasons, I don't actually like the series that much, because I just don't get into that sort of thing. I don't like gore. I don't like uh, shock. It, and I, I hate myself for saying this, because this sounds pretentious, but this is the truth. I get really bored at uh, horror games and horror movies like that. I just get there, and I'm just like... And I just get... It, it's it's dull to me, and I don't know how to explain why. It just doesn't catch me. I guess because I don't enjoy being frightened. I, I've spoken well of, of games that have a horror scene or a horror element in them, but overall aren't. You know, like Dragon Age Origins, for example. Um, but... Uh, that's I, I don't know. It's it, maybe it's easier because I only am dealing with it once, and maybe I can actually take it in small doses. I, I really don't know how to explain it, so I do apologize. Um, I, I really mean nothing actually negative about the game. It is a very competently made game, and it is something that a friend of mine who is into that kind of thing loves the heck out of. He he plays it a lot. He was really big into Doom Three as well, to give you another example, and I was not. <laughs> but you know, I, I have nothing negative to say about it. It's just I personally don't get into that. It's not my thing. So. Next thing. Um, will I be trying to contact thatguywithglasses.com to join their site? No, I will not. Uh, I have no interest in join, joining any organization or group unless it's, you know, like the escapist or something offers me a job. I would take that in a heartbeat. But I really doubt that's going to happen. But I also, to be completely honest, I don't think I am... I don't even know how to put this. I don't think I'm a big enough deal. I don't think I'm big enough time to actually justify anybody, you know, putting me up as, you know, the newest guy on that guy with glasses or anything like that. So it's not really a... 
something I really thought about. Have I ever played Demon's Crest? Uh, if that's the one back on the NES, I actually meant to look that up. I'll look that up right now while I go to the next one. Uh, why don't I pirate? Because I can answer that without looking anything up. The answer... Actually, I think the question is, do you pirate, or why don't you pirate? It is the Demon Crest. That was. Actually, that was back on the Super Nintendo. That was a good game. Uh, it's a side-scroller where you play a demon, and if there was a story to there, I don't remember it. But it was an enjoyable side-scroller back in the, the golden era of side-scrollers, if you will. Enjoyable game. Um, why don't I pirate? There's two thought, my, uh, thought processes here. One is from a purely ignoring all moral implications, and one is only considering moral implications, okay? Completely ignoring moral implications. The simple fact of the matter is, a game has to justify itself to me in terms of time, not money. Money isn't an issue for me. I have a full-time job. I'm a network engineer. I'm, I'm, not, I'm fine for money. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not well off. I am technically in the poverty line as far as the U.S. government is concerned, but I eat every day, and I have a car, and I can play video games, so money really isn't the issue here. The issue is time. A video game has to just... anything, really, has to justify itself in terms of time spent on it, and that is something that's much more difficult to do because of how little time, free time I have in my day, as indeed many people have that problem these days. And so the concept of downloading a game, you know, illegally, pirating a game in order to not play it is, is just kind of... it doesn't make sense to me if it makes any sense, because I would much... if I'm going to make the time for it anyways, the money isn't a consideration, so I would much rather go ahead and just buy it and, and have it and never have to worry about it. And on the other hand, uh, in the moral implication sense here, uh, I don't agree with pirating personally. Like As I said uh, in my previous Q&A, I do know people who pirate and to do so for what I consider to be good reasons. The demoing concept is an, is an excellent example of that, to demo a game and see if it's worth buying. And if it is, then they buy it and keep playing it. But if it isn't, then they put the game down. And <laughs> the end, you know? And honestly, I think that sort of thing should happen legitimately anyways. You just get a you get a copy of the game and you play it for however many times. I, I understand that there's difficulties and prob problems with making that happen. I understand why people don't do that. I, I get it completely. That's unrealistic. But in fantasy land over here, in Arshi and Gaia's perfect world, it would be really nice if full demos of the game that just had like a timer on them. You know, you could play this for three days or whatever, or two hours or something like that, and then it stops. So you can actually play the full game and really get a feel for it, and then, oh, okay, well, you know, I like this, so I'll go ahead and buy it and keep playing. That'd be nice. Instead of the demos we get now, which are usually designed to showcase the game and sell you on it, for obvious reasons, because they want money. And, and I'm not saying that's like a bad thing. You know, they need to, they need to eat and play video games too. But, um, like I said, necessary evil. But uh, the point is, they want to sell you on it, and so they're not showing you the game as it is, they're showing you the game at its best. This is all a complicated issue, and I'm, this is getting a little bit long, but the point is, while that is a valid reason, I think, it is not one I will consider valid for myself, partially because of the time issue, but mostly because I want to support game developers. I want to, to say, this game was amazing. And I'm going to throw my dinky little pennies into the pile for that game. I know it doesn't matter in the long run, but for me it matters. For me, it matters that I bought that game because I support that game, because I support those people. And I want to show that with in the only way I really have the availability to do. So, that would be why. Uh, final question, have I seen Death Note? Yes, I have, only the uh, anime. I never got into the manga, or manga and uh, never got into the live-action movies. One of the only animes I actually ever enjoyed was Death Note, and only because it was fascinating. Uh, <laughs> in, in a really morbid sort of way, I guess, is obvious from a show like that. I don't like anime in general. There's only uh, three, I guess? Four, technically. So four animes I've ever actually enjoyed in my life. Ever. And that is one of them. So, hey. Next question. Ah, uh, get some water. What is your favorite game on the SNES? Uh, Final Fantasy VI. What? <laughs> the problem is the SNES has so, 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 so many games that are like in my... If I were to pull out my top 20, at least half of that is SNES games. There were just... There was just the, that was what I consider to be the golden age of gaming uh, to date. It is, it is likely we're going on to another one now. But that was... There was just so many quality games. Not just the mainstream ones, but the hidden gems, as I mentioned before. The, the diamonds in the rough. There were so many excellent games on the SNES. I, I, I couldn't possibly... I would have to sit down and, and get a list of all SNES games ever and just start going to the list being like, that one, that one, 
that one, that one, you know, th th that's what I'd have to do in order to list that, so FF6, because that's the obvious answer, and Chrono Trigger, and FF4, and Secret of Mana, I could keep going. Uh, and uh, have I heard about emulators that a lot, y yes, I know what emulation is, uh, obviously, since I I was part of the RPGE team back in the day, uh, translating FF5 and Second Densetsu 3, and Earthbound Zero. Uh, actually, I wasn't a part of the Earthbound Zero team. I got in on the board uh, after Earthbound, or rather, towards the tail end of Earthbound Zero, and heard about the whole thing and wanted to contribute, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry, I'm boring you. Point is, I'm well aware of emulation and how it works. I personally only emulate games I already own, for the moral reasons I just mentioned about pirating. And I only do that because I don't feel like bringing my SNES into work, if you understand what I mean. But what are my thoughts on that? This is going to be a little bit lengthy, so I do apologize. But this is something I do feel strongly about and have been discussing with my friends recently. <sighs> Physical cartridges, like, like the SNESs or the NESs, have already, at this point, been degrading for a few decades. And we're at the point where it is getting harder and harder for those things to actually function. It is very possible... Uh, let me give you an example. Any of you who are familiar with Doctor Who know that there are however many episodes, hundred and something episodes, that are just gone. They don't exist. We don't have them. We don't know them. We have some stills in some cases. We have some notes in some cases. But the actual episodes are gone because the medium was never preserved. And there is a real danger of this happening, except for emulation. The ROMs of these games is how these are going to be carried forward into future generations. And I personally think there should be some legitimate manner of this. I actually had the idea that if you put a SNES emulator on the 3DS, for example, or, you know, on Steam, on the PC, this is something that you could do. There are the, the, There is one obstacle to this concept, and that is licensing. As of, of course, legal issues is what's in the way. Sorry. That bothers the crud out of me. Let's just move on. Legal issues are the problem. Of course, that's all. That's just legal issues. But if we moved the legal issues over here and they all fell off a cliff and died, then what we would be left with is the ability to put those legitimately on there and just put, you know, SNES Archive, 20 bucks, on Steam. And it would be preserved. Literally preserved. And, and you, it wouldn't just have to be Steam. You could put it on the 3DS, or you could put it on the, the PSP, or wherever. You could put it on the Wii, you could put it on the PS3. All these things would work. Uh, and the Xbox, sorry. I tend to forget Xbox because I don't own an Xbox. I'm not going into that discussion because no one's asked me that question yet. Nothing against Xbox users, I just want to get that out there. Nothing against them at all. But moving on. If you could just do that legitimately and actually make a legitimate effort, you know, the SNES emulator, rather than the ones that we, the, the people, have, have made over time through to, due to t effort and, and trial and error and, and, and reverse engineering the actual game, and it still isn't perfect, go pull up a Chrono Trigger on an emulator sometime, and it will not be an actual proper emulation of the game because we still don't know everything that went on the SNES. Still... Do it legitimately, guys. Put it out there. It, it, charge more than 20 bucks for the pack. Charge like 100. I'd still buy it. I'd still do my part to say, yes, please, God. Because and even ignoring the concept of preserving it for the future so that we don't have another Doctor Who incident, the simple fact of the matter is th sitting down and playing a SNES game is harder to do on the actual console or the NES game or anything of that era, really. You know, even a PS1 is harder to do than it has ever been at this point in time, you know? I, I actually can't right now. I lack the ability to play a SNES game on my SNES. My SNES! It's the one my dad bought me for, for Christmas. You know, when the SNES came out. I still have that same console. I can't play it because I have nothing to hook it up into. Sorry about that, uh had a phone call there, but as I was trying to say, the point is, I lack the ability to play the SNES anymore. I, I just can't. It's not feasible. I, I have nothing... I would need a box to translate, to hook the SV video in, you know, and then to do the HDMI out into the into the monitor. And I can't do that. I, I mean, I could. It's like a $70 box. I've looked it up. My goodness. So, you get the point. I do think emulation being done legitimately is something that should happen. <sighs> Sorry about the, the trade there, but I needed to mention that. Um... What could I also talk about some books I've really enjoyed? Most of the books I've enjoyed are more science fiction. Uh, a lot of them have been Star Wars, some of them have been not. Uh, I was a big fan of Honor Harrington, as I mentioned. I like the Harry Potter series. Honestly, uh, that's uh, that's a lengthy thing, and I really don't know where to start there, as weird as it is. I get into books that really make me... 
sit on the edge of my seat. Not just because not not because it's tense or not because there's a lot of action, because I want to know what happens next. I when I read a book, I want to read that book in one sitting because I don't want to put it down, if you know what I mean, a real page turner. And very few books really c- catch me in that sense. Partially because I read so fast. I am actually a speed reader uh and I read extremely quickly. And so that's okay, that's nothing. Sorry. <laughs> I've already been cold once tonight. Um so, I, I really don't know, even know what to say. I enjoy books a lot, and uh, the end, I guess. Um, what do I think of Ridley Scott as a director? That's an interesting question. God, I keep saying that, and I'm sorry. He, uh, I really enjoyed Blade Runner. I really enjoyed... Uh, well, Alien was alright. I actually liked Aliens better, but for different reasons. Again, I don't get into horror. But I have to say, one of the things I really enjoy about Ridley Scott is he has a very strong sense of show rather than tell. If you can get across an idea, a feeling, an emotion, a sense, you know, a, a, a concept, whatever, and you can do that by simply showing it or by implying it rather than saying, this is the idea, then he prefers to do that, and he does that brilliantly. I think he does an excellent job of that, and so, you know, definitely props to the man. Um, what is my favorite console from each console generation, and why, and what is my favorite game on that console? I'm only going to start at Generation 3, because... Saying which of my favorite <laughs> ones of, you know, of the old Amigas and the Apple IIEs is just, I don't know, whichever one happened to be at whichever house I was at at the time. But I'm going to start at the NES, which is Generation 3, which, the NES, by the way, the NES wins. As far as which favorite game, that'd probably be Super Mario Brothers 3 or Mega Man 2, possibly uh, Final Fantasy, or uh, Dragon Quest or Dragon Quest 3. It, I, I could keep going for a while, actually. It's always the problem with these. There's so many. Uh, second generation, or sorry, fourth generation. The SNES wins hands down. Favorite games, uh, as I just mentioned, FF6, FF4, Secret of Mana, Chrono Trigger, Link to the Past, dozens more. The fifth generation, uh, PlayStation One, I would say is my favorite. Favorite games on that: uh, Suikoden 2, Final Fantasy Tactics, Final Fantasy 7, uh, Final Fantasy 9. Uh, again, lots of uh, plenty of good games on there. So you know, it's hard to narrow it down. Now we get into something interesting. Uh, next generation was the sixth, and I actually think the PS2 and the GameCube are tied for me, and the reason is because both had such really, truly excellent games on them. You know, uh, Metroid Prime, for example, on the GameCube, and Zelda Twilight Princess, both are art games, is my opinion, you know, way up there. But at the same time, PS2 had had a, a very, very large library, uh, not as many as, as to that level of quality, in my opinion, but still a huge library of good games and great games and excellent games and you know I would probably go ahead and point to uh, Kingdom Hearts 2 if I had to pick one on the PS2 although that's really a hard one you know there was also you know uh, Final Fantasy 12, uh, Devil May Cry 3 um, I'm trying to think of the name of it, uh, Shadows of the Colossus that's another excellent one on the PS2 so next generation uh, I do actually prefer the Wii over the 3 as I mentioned, I don't own an Xbox uh, for my own personal reasons. Again, nobody's asked me that yet. The PS3 has some really good games on it. I do own a PS3, as I mentioned, and I do have like 12 games on it, but I do have like 20 games on the Wii, and that basically means the Wii wins. <laughs> um, now, of this, I wasn't counting handhelds. So, I do own uh, a Game Boy, a Game Boy Color, a Game Boy Advance, a Game Boy DS. I will be buying a 3DS because its game library has convinced me. I'm just not there yet, and uh, I own a PSP as well. So if I had to pick of that of that mess, I'd probably say the DS of all of those or the GBA. It's kind of hard, hard between the two, but probably the DS, especially since I can play G- GBA games. But um, I do, like I said, I do plan on getting a 3DS. I have no plans on getting a Vita, a Vita, however you say that, because I have not seen a single game on it that is interesting to me. So, shrug. What is my take on procedural generation within games? Uh, Any of you aren't aware aware of this. This is actually kind of a complicated concept. But basically, procedural generation as opposed to manual means... um, Okay, the best way I could explain it is if any of you played Daggerfall, that was procedural generation. That's probably probably the uh, best example that I could say right off the top of my head. It was literally randomly generated on-the-fly dynamic content you know, that was created as you go through, rather than a static area like, say, Morrowind had, which was manually generated. Now, I personally 
think Daggerfall pulled it off really well. I tend to prefer manual generation myself. I tend to prefer it because of the amount of detail you can put into it, the attention, the, the effort, and all that. This is also potentially speaking, of course, but, you know, to use the same example, Morrowind versus Daggerfall, I prefer Morrowind because they really put a lot of heart and effort into the actual detail of manually generating that island. Now, the catch here is that if I were asked honestly, if I were making my ideal game, uh, I think a degree of of procedural generation could be used in certain segments and certain concepts in certain areas to really flesh out the, the randomness, the, the, the generation of it, so that it's it's not the same experience every time, while still having a core base of manual generation. I think that would be ex you know an excellent game, but that's just my opinion. Um, have I played any RTS games other than StarCraft? Yes, my goodness. It would be difficult for you to name an RTS game I haven't played. He mentions uh, Company of Heroes. Yes, I've played Company of Heroes. Um, it's actually not bad. It has a uh, uh, World in Conflict is another one. Good example. Uh, actually, he mentions that as well. I do like RTS games with story. StarCraft 2 and WarCraft 3 are probably my favorites on that one. But it's also worth noting that the Command and Conquers always really had a really... I wouldn't say it had an excellent story so much as an excellent presentation of a story, if you follow me. There wasn't a story, per se. You were just following the events of the war, but it was well presented, and, and they, they kept to that live-action thing that I really enjoyed, especially back in the day. But, you know, even even into more modern eras, I did enjoy, like I said, Red Alert 3. I'm, like, the only person, but, you know, whatever. Uh, so, like I said, you name it as RTSs, I probably played it. Um... Now, this, this gentleman asked a question about the difference between 2D games and 3D games. Now, this is not talking about the 3D glasses. This is actually three-dimensional gameplay versus, you know, two-dimensional gameplay. Um, now, w this is actually a lengthy question. I just copy-pasted this, didn't I? Da -da -da -da. Does 2D game development have an advantage over 3D development even today? Yes, it does. Uh, I can give you a direct example of this. Mega Man 9 and Mega Man 10 are both modern 2D games built on the old 8-bit engine but modified for the modern era so that they can do so much more with it because the technology exists now. But rather than spending that technology making it look nice, what they're doing is spending that technology making it more, if you, if you understand what I mean. Uh, they can do so much more with the stages, they can do so much more with the abilities you get, they can do so much more with the movements you can do. They have mo the ability to make more options because the technology is there now, and they're sitting it on an old engine which doesn't require that much time and development and money. And so I'm in favor of that kind of thing. Uh, not as a overall, you know, that, that thing can be overdone, just like anything. But I do like that concept, and I do like the, the occasional effort of that. Uh, next question, has 3D gaming become overrated? Uh, yes and no. I think it's more accurate to say that shiny graphics have become overrated. Not every game has to be u uber, super awesome looking, in my opinion. You know, Crisis is an excellent example of a game that I think went too far with the graphics. Decent games, I might add. You know, <laughs> but they were decent games regardless of the graphics, if you understand me. It's like, okay, yeah, th this is really nice looking. Moving on. Moving on. We're walking. We're walking. But, um, nobody in my audience is going to get that. Um, but my point is that... I do like shiny, you know, to an extent. I do like looking out at a vista and just going, oh, it's beautiful. But those moments can be accomplished without, uh, with lesser graphics engine. You know, uh, to give you something really uh, frank, and you can go ahead and make fun of me for this if you'd like, World of Warcraft on several occasions has had moments where I've been standing on a vista or, or a plateau or whatever and looked around and was just like, wow, that just looks gorgeous. In World of Warcraft, which is not exactly the shiniest looking game around, so you can pull that sort of look off without having to put all the effort into the, into the, the 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 detail into the the high def and all that. So, anyways, that's that's my opinion. I'm sorry, a little bit of rambling there. Um, still blah blah blah. Should there still be 2D development from major developers? And do you feel people will still be still buy 2D games? Yes, and yes. Uh, that's also been kind of proven at this point. People do still buy 2D games, uh, especially on the indie market. But I think if people with AAA level of uh, of budget and development actually put the time and effort into making a good 2D game of, in the modern era, I think it would sell rather well. But that's just my opinion. And again, I think that that, as with all things, has to be done in moderation. I think there is room for both 3D games and 2D games. I just think we need to find more of a balance here, in my personal opinion. Uh, do I agree with or go against the indoctrination theory? Uh, I mentioned this in my indoctrination theory video quite a while ago, but uh, I disagree with it uh, for the most part. Or I guess I should say I go against it. While it is really well designed and it is definitely something that a lot of thought was put into, I think all those things can be explained away by budget and, and delay and possibly laziness or just not caring anymore. Much easier than they can be explained by some massive conspiracy theory. It's still possible, don't get me wrong, but I don't believe the indoctrination theory myself personally. Uh, what do I think about the Baldur's Gate remake they're doing? I think 
Yes and no. Good and bad here. The idea that they're doing a, uh, a, a new Baldur's Gate 2, let's, let's just put this out there. I don't know if they're doing a remake or a port. I really don't. And that changes a lot. If they're doing a port, okay, I guess. Um, but I won't be buying it because I own Baldur's Gate 2. I could just go and get it working. Uh, there, there would be some patching involved because I have a Windows, you know, I have Windows 7. But I can do that. I see no reason to buy it for a modern system just because it's being re-released and they've fixed it or whatever. If they're doing a remake, if they're actually polishing it and adding to it and, and fleshing it out, okay, yeah, I'd be much more inclined to buy it. So overall, I'd say I consider it a good thing, especially since Baldur's Gate was one of two. Uh, Baldur's Gate Two was one of my favorite games of all time, but the Baldur's Gate series in general was always awesome. But I have to add one other thing, and that is that the gentleman in, who was talking about the Baldur's Gate series was talking about why it was not coming out on the Wii. Now I don't care if it's out on the Wii. I just want to point this out there. I don't. I don't want it to be out on the Wii. I'd buy it on the PC. But he was saying things that were rather unkind and rather untrue, and simply by virtue of that, I was disinclined to buy his game, if you understand what I mean. I'm not going to go any further detail here. You can look it up yourself if you really want to know what I'm talking about. But, yeah, moving on. Um, do I think a modern PS3 remake of FF6 can bring it to a new generation of fans? If there is a remake, can it work? Uh, yes, and yes. It has to be a proper remake, I think, but to be completely honest with the way things are going, that is much more likely to come out on a handheld. I really hope they do push forward with the 3DS, uh, FF4, 5, and 6 remakes they've been talking about doing for like two years now. But who knows if that's ever going to happen at this point. Uh, regardless, I do think a modern remake on any system that is actually a proper remake of FF6 would go over rather well, and I would love to see a new generation of, of gamers look into it and really get into what I personally consider to be the best game ever made. Um, next question. Uh, what is your opinion on the Fable series of games, and what, can, in your opinion, can Lionhead do to improve the series from what has been becoming recently? Fable, uh, especially Fable, the original, but Fable, Fable 2, and Fable 3 have always struck me as what I consider, consider some game. It is, you know, it's like, uh, I get this phrase from Top Gear, blah, is some car. You know, it's it's not a good car, it's not a bad car, it's not an exotic car, it doesn't strike out, it's it's car, it's the default car. And that's what Fable has always been to me for uh, video game RPGs, for especially Western RPGs, if you want to get into it. F uh, Fable has always felt like the default. Like, that's what you start with, and then you start, you know, you work from there, and whether it gets get good or worse from that depends on how you do it. So I've never really had what you'd call a strong opinion about Fables, the Fables. I really disliked Fable for a while, and that was because it was hyped up as a Morrowind killer, and this was at a time when I was playing Morrowind religiously, and was really excited for a game that was even more in-depth than Morrowind, and then I got Fable. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, what do I think they could do to improve the series? Honestly, I think they need to find a niche. Because, like I said, the game is just sort of there. They need to find something other than the Cockney accent that, that, that defines Fable. Because that's the only thing I can come up with right now at the top of my head. Define Fable other than default RPG. Uh, Cockney accent. That, that's all I've got for you. They need to find a niche, and they need to go, okay, this this is what we're going to be from now on, and, and do that. You know. Um, next question. Aren't you getting in trouble for doing all your videos at work? Uh, no. The reason for that is actually really uh, simple. I have an understanding here. I'm. I, this is not bragging. I'm actually very good at my job, and I do make a point of doing my job. And the job always comes first. That That's kind of important. That's always been the, the deal here with me and my bosses, is I will do my job, and I'll do my job first, and you'll leave me alone. And so I do whatever here on my time. Uh, within reason, obviously. I'm not going to go set up my PS3 and just start playing whatever in the, in the knock there. But I will do basically whatever, within reason, as long as I get the job done first. And that's always been the deal, and I do get my job done. I, the reason I started at 1.30 tonight was because I didn't finish doing my job until, like, 12.30. And then I sat down and started working on this, so... Um... I don't recall... Ah! This person says he doesn't recall uh, seeing any comments about Rift, was wondering if he had missed it somewhere and what my thoughts were on it. I actually did a whole review of Rift. In fact, Rift was the very first MMO I ever reviewed on this site. Uh, on this site, on YouTube. 
in this format, I suppose. Rift, uh, I'll, I'll summarize really quick. I gave Rift a 5 out of 10, and my reason for that was because Rift was kind of the fable of MMOs for me. It was very down the middle of the line. I, I found nothing wrong with it. Nothing really bothered me about it, but nothing really engaged me either. Nothing really jumped out at me. The Rift concept itself was interesting, but that's something I'd already seen prior to then in Champions Online and Star Trek Online. And so, shrug, you know? Not, nothing bad about it. It's just not something I really got into. Um... One gentleman asked a question in Greek, but the last word he said, uh, I had no idea what he meant. And without that word, the sentence itself may, had made no sense in, in any level of context, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask that person to repeat his question. Sorry. Uh, next question. Uh, how do you feel about YouTubers uploading playthroughs revealing pure gaming content in parts of playlists? I do actually uh, like that in some respects. Let me give you a direct example here. Metal Gear Solid 4. Bleh, Metal Gear Solid 4 is a game I played through once, uh, twice actually. Played through once and then I 100 percented it. And uh, probably will never actually play again because while it was certainly a, a well-crafted story, it's not that enjoyable to play so much as it is to watch. And so nowadays, there is a Metal Gear Solid 4 playlist that I can just sit up and if I ever feel like the game again, I just load that and start watching that. And that has the advantage of me being able to watch it wherever and still enjoy it. And, you know, I did already buy the game, so it's not like I'm, I'm skipping out on it or anything. And I still get to be like, oh, that boss was awesome, or that boss was terrible. But I get to enjoy it without any of the negative effects of actually having to sit down, plug in the PS3, plug in the thing, plug in the monitor, sit down, play for two hours, and then put it down again. So, I do actually personally agree with that, but I can see a lot of reasons why it would be considered a negative thing. And as with all things, that has to be taken in moderation, so it kind of depends. I uh, personally go really out of my way to avoid video playlists for games that I haven't played yet, partially because I don't want any spoilers, partially because I don't want because uh, I want to explore things for myself, I want to understand things for myself, and I, if I need a walkthrough, I'll look it up. And I like having that option. I like being able to say, okay, I need a video showing me where this item is. Watch the video. Oh, oh, it was behind the corner, huh? I'm an idiot. You know, I like being able to do that, but I won't do that by default because, you know, blah. So I like having the option, I guess. Uh, net benefit for me. Um, uh, this person asked if he can buy, where he can buy Dragon Egg Origins. I don't know if Steam is available in the UK. Um, I guess it doesn't matter now. It just hit me because they just, they finally pulled Dragon Age off of Steam. But the Origins... You know what? No, I'm, I'm actually not going to recommend Origins because screw Origins. I'm, I'm taking that back. Origins isn't I'm against Origins fundamentally, but there's nothing actually wrong with it. So, if you can go ahead and buy it online through Origins, if not, uh, I have no idea otherwise. I'm not even sure if Origins is available overseas. I would imagine it is, because of how big their market is over there, but whatever. I would prefer it, that you were to get it on Steam, but they pulled it off of Steam, so whatever. Uh, let's see, one quick question. What do I think about the ability to side with the enemy, such as the Skyrim Dragons or the Enclave and Fallout? Should that be an option in such games, and should it be for evil and or good characters? In an ideal world, yes. Um, because the the ideal play setup would be like this. Let's use the Enclave as an example. As a good character, in an ideal setup, I should be able to join the Enclave to take them down from the inside, if you follow me. You know, be a good guy, sabotage them, work through them, you know, have a whole quest chain and series dealing with bringing them down internally until, you know, I win. Um, and of course, again, speaking ideally, it should be possible to be the bad guy, to be the villain, and go ahead and join the Enclave and take over the Wasteland, and that would be awesome. You know, join the dragons and, and bring about the end of the world. Why not? I do like options in games, even if I don't personally take them, even if I don't play evil characters, I think that sort of thing should be in games. I do encourage it, I do support it, and I do hope more people do that sort of thing in the future. Uh, it is worth noting that you can do that in New Vegas, you can join Kaisar's Legion and kill them all. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Let's see, next question. Uh, how do I feel about Javik as a character? That would be the Prothean for anyone who doesn't know in Mass Effect 3. I actually was impressed by that. I thought he was extremely well done. I thought he did add to the story. I thought he did, you know, he, he was a net benefit. But if I was to complain about him at all, I would say that I don't think he needed to be playable. I thought, I, you know, he didn't need to be a member of the party. I never used him, not once, uh, because I never needed to. Everything that I enjoyed about him was the cutscenes you get from him and, and going and talking to him and finding out that him talking about Liara and finding out about his past and the shard and all that stuff. So... You know, I'm kind of a mixed opinion there, but I do think adding Javik was a net benefit, and I do support that overall. Uh, 
As a creator, how do you go about creating an engaging story? Do you read things like TV tropes? Yes, I do. Uh, do you know anything about dramatica theory? Yes, I do. Um, honestly, I can only give you two real advice points here. One is to for your characters to think about them as if they were real people and try and characterize that. Once you write a sentence or, or a line or a paragraph or a page or whatever, go back and reread it and say it out loud. If, you know, I mean literally say it out loud like I'm doing right now. Does this sound like someone would actually say? Because things are different written and spoken and you really need to, to try and get that believability across. And speaking of believability, make sure the setting makes sense. Make sure it's very self-consistent. Unless you're writing a tale, which is fine. But either way, try to make it make sense. Try to make it be congruent in some way so that it actually fits together and you can go back and go, oh, that makes sense. And nobody has to be going, well, that, why would that happen? That's always the bad sign from writing. If someone, if one of your readers is going through and the whole time they're just going, well, I don't understand why he's doing that over there. You know, something is failing all online here. It may not be you, but you get the idea here. <sighs> That's the only advice I could give you, unfortunately. So, moving on. Um, what do I think about strategy RPGs such as Fire Emblems, Tactics Ogre, and Final Fantasy Tactics? I've played all of the above. Uh, I play them a lot. I really enjoy strategy RPGs uh, a great deal. Final Fantasy Tactics I didn't actually get into personally because I don't like that style. Um, as weird as that sounds, I don't like the, the grid thing. I, I don't know how to explain it. If anybody's played Final Fantasy, Tact Final Fantasy Tactics, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Tactics Ogre liked. Uh, Ogre Battle is probably actually my favorite. He does actually ask which is my favorite. Ogre Battle would be my favorite. But the Fire Emblem series certainly comes in a close second for that. Um, what is your opinion of mods and modding, and do you see them as important to the innovation of games? Are there any mods you particularly enjoy from any game? I have always been a huge proponent of modding, ever since uh, Morrowind, actually, would probably be the, the furthest back. You know, I, I mod all over the place in World of Warcraft. I mod all over the place in all the Elder Scrolls games and the Fallouts. I mod Dragon Age, you know, <laughs> anything I can, basically, without actually either, you know, fundamentally screwing up the gameplay or getting in legal trouble. I do mod. I enjoy modding. I enjoy it because it is customization incarnate. It is the ability to say, well, I want this, but I want this like this, or I want it like this, you know, or whatever, however it is that works for you, you know. I love that concept, I love that idea, I love the fact that I can customize the game to myself, because it's what I want to do. So, ooh, and uh, I am very big on that. As far as <laughs> which mods I particularly enjoy, god, I don't know, all of them? Uh, that's actually not true, I don't enjoy all the mods. There are bad mods, and there are disgusting mods, which we're not even going into. But, I, there are, I, in general, I couldn't even narrow that down, you know. The, the epitome of what I like would probably be most described as Fook 2, which is a Fallout 3 and a Fallout New Vegas mod and F-O-O-K-2. It, just go ahead and look it up. It would be much quicker than anything I could explain, but that that's the only one individually I could point out right off the top of my head. I, I like mods in general. Let's just move on. Uh, what are your thoughts on this indie love and adoration that seems to have been on the gaming scene recently? Is all this faith and support deserved? And he mentions the, uh, the Kickstarter thing. As usual, I find myself having to say the words in moderation because the concept of Kickstarter is something I am fully in favor of in moderation. You know, conceptually speaking, the concept of an indie game, you know, those, all those indie games that are on Steam and whatnot, fully in support of it in moderation. I do not think that that sort of thing should overtake the... Uh, the market, I guess you should say. I don't think it should be getting the attention it, it is getting right now. It is possible that will stop as as the wave of the trend dips back down. But by the same token, it is a good it is a good concept, and I am very in favor of that. You know, the kick, Kickstarter being used to set up a real game is awesome. The problem is so many people are overusing it. I have seen so many terrible projects on Kickstarter. I stopped looking. I stopped browsing Kickstarter and just kind of let it be because after the first full, you know few several games that I saw that were actually good the rest were just terrible so those are my thoughts I, I do think people are going a little overboard with it but that's what people tend to do in general in my opinion I think you know just rein it back a bit guys just just pull it back you know um I, uh, I I have said this is the next question I've said that I don't like free to play games because they're essentially pay to win do you think there's any promise in the FTP model? What if it was pay to get cool cosmetic stuff like was done with mounts in something like such as World of Warcraft? The uh, free-to-play model is something that is very difficult to pull off properly. And I, I'm not going to go into more detail on that because that would actually take a while. I do apologize. But the, f the fact of the matter is pulling that off properly essentially means getting the right balance of content and 
patch updates and that sort of thing, while at the same time charging just enough, yet not too much, for the right amount of things, but not too many things, but not too few things, in order to properly make money off of it, in order to keep going. And it's hard to, harder to do than it sounds, which is why so many FTP things are pay to win, and they just they just go a little too far this way, and they say, well, okay, pay to win. Pay to get to this level, pay to access content. You know, DDO is an excellent example of that, unless you subscribe. Or is there a subscription off from DDO anymore? I don't even know. But, you know, uh, there was actually a Shin Megami Tensei MMO that came out that was literally... There was no subscription. You had to pay to access zones and, and, and access content in those zones. And that is the furthest extreme of the, of the pay-to-win. You know, it's not just pay-to-win, it's, it's pay-to-play at all. Uh, and so, not really in favor of that. However, it is worth noting that paying uh, microtransactions for purely cosmetic things, I have always been completely in favor of. If I want to spend 10, 20, 30 bucks, 3 bucks, 50 cents on looking nicer, I have always been 100% in favor of that, you know, uh, that that's the kind of thing that I think should be what DLCs actually mean, is cosmetic, you know, purchasable cosmetic options for your game, rather than what DLCs actually mean these days. So, fully in favor of that, but I wish games did that more, you know, World of Warcraft, props to them, has done this perfectly right. You can pay real money for cosmetic things, you can pay for, for mounts or the pets or whatever, and it looks cool. And if, you know, maybe you're getting it because you want to look cool, maybe you're getting it because you, you want to show off, whatever your reason, that's fine, and I'm in favor of that. I support that, so I'm, I'm really with that. But uh, let's move on here. Um, where did the sign-off noise come from? I've actually answered that a couple times now. Uh, in brief, b when I was doing uh, television editing back in uh, back in Topeka, I used to uh, be, be the guy in the booth, the director, the one who was actually on the headset communicating with everyone. And th we were using switches back then. We didn't use we didn't have digital medium. It was all analog. And whenever I shut off the recording, you know, it would go down. It would make this sound, you know, really audible. And it we had cues on the headsets to be able to tell people, you know, this this means you need to uh, this means you need to drag it out. This means you need to hurry up and finish the article. This means you need to uh, go ahead and cut to the next camera. You know, we had all the sorts of audio cues rather than just saying, "Hey, go to do blah 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 blah." So we could do it quick and easy, and it was very coordinated. And the cue for "We're done. We've stopped recording." Was and so without even thinking about it, when I was doing these videos, I just started going every time I, I finished the video, and I, I tried to make myself stop, and my sister forced me to keep doing it, because she loved the so, whatever. Anyways, uh, there's the answer again. Um, uh, do I, uh, I, I do play Pokemon. Uh, a general view of the Pokemon games, I wouldn't mind doing that at some point in time. Uh, just as, uh, out there right now, I do really enjoy the Pokemon games. Uh, not just the catch them all concept, which I, is something I do enjoy, but the, the games themselves have always been a type of RPG that very few RPGs do, and that's the <sighs> preparatory strategy. Which means walking into the battle with the right team and the right setup and the right concept and the right combo and the right skills and the right EVs and the right IVs in order to and the right items in order to uh, properly be, be basically ready for anything. And then when you're actually in the fight, you, the strategy is much less unless you're on some of the extra hard stuff at the end. So it's it's the preparatory, it, it's the setup and and the the build up and the raising and you know the monster setup and all that. I really get into that and I really enjoy that. It's it's almost uh, art. And a strategy RPG in that sense, and uh, I really enjoy that. Like I said, so that, that's my view in some synopsis. I'll do a more extensive review later. Am I familiar with Smud Boy? Uh, actually, no, I never heard of that before. This person mentions it. I went and uh, you know looked it up in response to this question. I saw him and I was like, okay. I didn't have time to watch him because I was doing my my job at the time. But you know, I, obviously, I don't have any opinion then because I have no idea who this guy is. So I'm sorry, I don't really have anything to add here. Uh, this guy was asking about Warcraft lore. Do I think Illidan and Medivh should be brought into War Warcraft lore and WoW? Um, yes and no, respectively. Illidan could be brought back rather easily, and in my opinion should be. Illidan was always a very major character in the lore, especially in the books, and uh, was um, one of the major proponents of the world changing like three times. So him, he really received an injustice in, in Burning Crusade, and that was because of several miscommunication issues and, and writing issues that I'm not even going into. <clears throat> But the point is that they they screwed up, and I would like them. <coughs> excuse me, I would like them to fix that and bring Illidan back and actually have him be a proper character again. Pardon me. Oh, I'm starting to get a headache here. Uh, as far as Medivh, I don't think Medivh should come back. I think he should be allowed to rest, to put that nicely. But I also think him coming back wouldn't really add anything to the story. However, Medivh's uh, 
grandson, for lack of a better term, or son, or however you want to define him, whose name I can't think of all of a sudden, uh, him being a, part, a greater part of the story I could see. Uh, any other characters I would like to see come back? Um, that's actually an interesting question. I, I hadn't really thought about that in advance. I do apologize. Uh, I can't really come up with any off the top of my head, but I wouldn't mind seeing... Oh, what's his name? Hmm... I wouldn't mind seeing more of certain characters. I don't want them to come back, per se, if you know what I mean. Arthas would be on that list, consequently. I would also put uh, Gul'dan on that list. That would be fascinating, and Gorefiend would be another excellent one. But ultimately, I, I actually don't think I could uh, would bring back any other characters. Oh, actually, that's a lie. I would bring back the expedition in, into Draenor. Torelian and uh, a sh Illyria? I can't think of how you pronounce her name off the top of my head. The the people who are at the moment missing from the uh, Draenor expedition, I would really like to see them come back and actually do something. Um, so, you know. Uh, next question. Have I ever played or heard of Drakensang? Uh, if yes, what did you think of it? If no, would you be willing to look into it? Um, I have actually heard of Drakensang. I did look into it briefly uh, the other day. I'd never heard of it prior to then, actually, to be completely honest with you, but I, I heard of it when it was mentioned. And I looked into it, and it was like, oh, that's interesting. And I realized that I wasn't going to have nearly the kind of time commitment to really get into it, which is unfortunate, because I would like to try it out. So I'm sorry again, but as usual, I, I can't do everything. I still have to deal with this job. Um, the other question is, uh, in Guild Wars 2, what is your favorite race and profession? Favorite race so far is Char, by far. The uh, storyline for Char is very well developed and very enjoyable. I've really been getting into it. The... Uh, humans would probably be second. My favorite profession, professions so far is probably Guardian and Necro, more or less tied. I never got to try Thief. They had some issues with Thief, and so I never actually got to try it in, th in full. And while I'm on the subject, I just want to point out real quick, Guild Wars 2 is doing another beta event today, uh, as, it, as in Monday. So for anybody who didn't get into the previous one, feel free to try it. It's a stress test, so there's going to be lag all over the place. But if you haven't, if you never got a chance, you know, feel free. Um, next question. Uh... Am I going to do another Guild Wars 2 video in the future? Yes, I am. Uh, but that's going to be a post-beta. The previous one was just a look at the beta. This is going to be a, you know, when the game is actually out video. Uh, what are you hoping to see in the next installment of the Fallout series? Obviously, Fallout 4 is obvious, but I would much prefer to see Fallout 4 it, it, rather than Fallout Online. I do not want a Fallout MMO. It could be pulled off, but I'd I would rather they didn't, if that makes any sense. I would much rather have another Fallout game than Fallout Online. That's just my opinion. Partially it's because I'm, I feel the MMO market is just getting too saturated. Partially be because too many MMOs are just me-toos. Which, which is, you know, me too! Me! I also want uh, an MMO! You know, it's just getting too much. And I really wish people would, you know, re make games again. <laughs> Where it was KOTOR 3 instead of TOR. Anyways. Um... Did I play any of the old Fantasy Star games? And yes, I did. Uh, I really enjoyed them. Not not one of my favorites, not in the, the art or in the favorites card, but probably right about here. They were games that were a little bit too anime-ish for me, especially at the time. That was before I'd liked any anime at all. And uh, not games that I would, you know, go back and replay that often, but I would like to replay them at some point in the time. So, really enjoyed them. Uh, I will consider doing reviews of them. I'll put them on the requested list. I think I already have, actually. What are my thoughts on Microsoft and Sony trying to get on a motion-controlled gaming, and do I see any other motion games coming out in the future? I think motion-controlled gaming needs to go away, to be completely honest with you. The Wii tried it, and I'll always give props to Nintendo, because Nintendo has been trying things for years. A lot of people tend to forget that. They've been trying different gimmicks and experiments for years, and every time one fails, they say, all right, move on, and they try something else, you know, and... uh the, and it's funny, because Nintendo basically already did that. You know, they were like, okay, the Wii the Moat thing didn't really work. They they pushed that for Zelda, because Skyward Sword was built from ground up to use the Wiimote controls, so they didn't have a chance to go back and undo all that. But other than that, most modern games are just played from the side with the controller, you know. That's why they finally came out with the classic controller, because that's how you want to play most Wii games. So I think that Sony and Microsoft are both kind of jumping on the boat that has already sailed, so they're just kind of jumping in the ocean there. I don't like motion controls. And let me just explain why really quickly. I hate to sound like, you know, a lazy, horrible human being here, but what would I rather do? Relax back in my chair and play my game and really focus on this and, you know, get the eye-hand coordination. Because I actually have pretty good eye-hand coordination. Obviously, I've been playing video games for 30 years. Um, you know, would I rather do this and play this and relax and be able to stretch? Oh, yeah, maybe move over here, stretch out my back a little bit. Or would I rather do this? <sighs> hang on, hang on, hang on, okay, okay. 
when I was playing uh, one of the Sonic games, uh, that would be Sonic and the Knights of something. What I can't even remember the name of the game now. It was it was the only Sonic game on the Wii I didn't like because I liked the other th uh, three. But this game had you doing this a lot, and it actually got to the point where my elbows started getting sore because of how much I was doing the flick in order to get them to get get the attack on it, because you had to do the flick. And that's usually bad game design, when your elbows start hurting from playing a game. I personally do not like motion control, and I really wish they'd stop using it. I am never buying a move on the PlayStation 3 ever. Even if a game I really like requires it, I don't care. And I really could not give a damn about the Kinect, to be completely honest with you, so moving on. Um, have I ever played Civilization Re Revolution on the Xbox? Obviously, I don't own an Xbox, but I have played it on the DS, and I don't know how different it is. I do think they should do more things like that. that uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Civilization Revolution was essentially a uh, toned-down, simpler version of a Civilization game, but it was still well done. It was still good. It just was less complicated, and it was less involved, so you could play a 40-minute, 30-minute civilization match rather than a six-day one, you know? And I, I like that. I'm, I'm with that. I understand that concept and I'm with it, so I think they should do more of that. I, I would be really awesome if they kept doing that kind of thing. What is my academic background? I guess I kind of already questioned that. Uh, questioned that. Answered that. But uh, I, I, as far as what, how well I did in school, which is the second question, I got straight A's. It, it wasn't hard. Uh, I don't mean, I'm sorry, that sounds really egotistical. I've always felt that getting A's in school is just a matter of whether or not you try to or not. Um, that's just my opinion, of course. Maybe that's just coming from my background. Uh, but that was the way my mother raised me. And the only reason I ever tried was because I figured it might matter at some point in time. It never has. <laughs> to be completely honest with you, nobody's ever come back and said, Aha! He got straight A's. Always. He was a 4.0 his entire life. That's fascinating. No, no, nobody's ever cared about that. So I, I, that's part, part of why I say that so casually. is like, yeah, I got straight A's, but it didn't matter. Um, but as far as academic background, I did go to college, uh, Washburn University, for anyone who's curious, and it was interesting. I did learn a great deal of things. I, I went into a great deal of uh, information. I went into a great deal of subjects there. I wasn't actually trying for a degree. I was just learning, and so that worked out for me. <laughs> At least I think so. Um, now, this is an interesting question for the 700th time. What are your true feelings on Mass Effect 3's Extended Cut DLC? Now, I find that interesting because it, it implies that the other four, five videos I did about Mass Effect 3 and the two of them that discussed the DLC were me faking my feelings about it. My true feelings I've already kind of said in detail. You know, um, and so I'm just going to summarize everything I already just said uh, in those videos really quickly. I think it, is, it has potential but I don't think it's going to fundamentally fix the flaws of Mass Effect 3. I think it's just going to potentially make it better. We'll see. Uh, next question. What do your friends in real life think about your new followers, meaning us? I would like to know what their reaction was to the fact that you got thousands of views for your first Mass Effect video. Uh, I've, <laughs> I've been getting a bit of ribbing about that, actually. Every time I come in here, one of the first things I do when I get into work, I relieve Gary over here. He's not actually there right now, but that's where he sits. And he he just sees me pull up uh, my email and and see the massive list of comments that I'm going through that day since I woke up. And he's like, "Oh, Mr. Popular over there," and he just ribs me about it, you know makes fun of me for it. You know, and my friend Sandra is, is says that a couple of things, and my my friend Sherston also said a few things. I'm not actually going to repeat these because I feel that they're too kind. They both think that I am, you know, some kind of celebrity, some kind of YouTube hotshot, which I don't think. I, I'm just a guy. I'm just a person who's, who's talking on YouTube, and some people enjoy listening to me, and that's great. I love that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you guys enjoy my videos. But I really don't think I'm, you know, some hotshot. It doesn't work that way. I'm just another guy. I'm just me. Now, this last question, I'm going to get some water for. Because this is a long one. You can feel we're cut off now. This is the last question. Uh... Actually, hold on a second. I'm just give me just one moment here. Let's see if any questions have been asked while I've been recording this. Oh, looks like no. Okay. <laughs> All right. So th this is uh, I tend to do what if scenarios in my head a lot because I find them fascinating. I find it interesting discussing something and analyzing analyzing something, even from a uh, speculative fashion. And one of the questions I have asked of my friends and had rather lengthy, hours-long discussions about is essentially, uh, there's no way to summarize this, but where would you go if you could, I, I guess is the best way to summarize it. The way this gentleman asks this is, 
You are given the option to go to any world you want, but you go as is, with only the clothes on your back and the skills you already have. It's a one-way trip, and you have to choose somewhere that is not Earth. Where do you pick, and what do you do once you go there? Now, this is a particular variation on what I call Tier 1. Tier 1 is when you have to choose a setting to go into, any setting, and you're basically as is. Now, I don't like to get into technicalities, so I always wave language. That's always the first thing I wave right off the bat. You can speak whatever the language, you can read, and you can understand, and you can, you know, write, and you can function. You know, for exa just to give you an example of what I mean here, if you were dumped in Star Trek right now, any Star Trek, but, you know, TNG is a great example. If you were dumped in TNG, while well, you would still be, probably be able to communicate with people because of the Universal Translator, uh, do you think you'd be able to make heads or tails of any of the panels? or be able to figure out how to use any of the computers in there without extensive training? No, of course not. And so, and that's it, that's especially true for Star Wars. I don't read Oribesh. I don't speak Oribesh, you know? I don't know how to do that. And so, there's sort of a wave here, is that you get the, the basic ability to function, you know, as a, as a being, as a member of that society. But that's it. That's all you get. You are still you. You're still human. You have no powers, no abilities. You are not adapted to the setting. You are just you. Now, really briefly, Tier 2 is what if you had the ability to choose a setting and you did adapt? For example, let's say you were flung into the Harry Potter setting and you had the ability to become a wizard, you know, as opposed to being flung to the Harry Potter setting normally, which would be terrible because you'd just be another person, human being, in what is essentially everyday Earth, except for the fact that you might be killed by wizards who are led by Voldemort. You know, <laughs> you get my point. But if you had the ability to adapt, that's a different question. And the third question is, what if, it, if, what if you had the ability to adapt and it was romanticized? And in brief, what I mean by that is, for example, if you had the ability to adapt to, say, Fallout 3, okay, so you can still adapt, that still doesn't fix the problem that you eat radioactive food, drink radioactive water, sleep on a smelly, dirty uh, thing, don't have the ability to shower unless you go into a river, you know, uh, have to go to bathroom in a ditch, you know, it just, it would be very unpleasant to live in unless it was romanticized. Uh, I call this the holodeck scenario, because in that say, case, all of the unpleasantness, the irritation, the small little undercurrent of reality is taken out of it, and instead you're just playing Fallout 3 yourself, if you follow what I'm saying here. Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean would, uh, would be another excellent example of something, or anything sailing, would be an example of something that is ultimately very unpleasant, but if you romanticized it, it would be fun. So that's Tier 3. I apologize for going into detail there, because this gentleman was obviously asking Tier 1. Now, I've debated Tier 1 a lot, and ultimately... Oh, pardon me, my answer is uh, the Star Wars universe. The reason for that is because while I would never be able to use the Force, or be a Jedi of any uh, kind, shape, or form, because I'm just me, and with the skills on my back, uh, just about at any setting you plop me in it, I have a significant amount of knowledge about Star Wars that I could make do, and I could probably set myself up as a smuggler, a bounty hunter, a, a freight runner, for God's sakes, and enjoy my life, and, and, and settle myself in rather comfortably. And I know this is a little basic sounding, but the, the, the basic reality here is that I'm trying to think of something where I could l make a living out of, because I, I only have the skills I actually have. So I'd have to learn something about the technology of the setting, but I can do that. You know, that's feasible. Uh, the other obvious answer is, of course, Star Trek, as I mentioned, because, again, I could make a life there, I could, especially as a human, because, hey, the Federation doesn't have money. <laughs> So I can just go to, you know, one of the, the planets of the Federation and exist. Now, of course, there's a lot of problems with Federation and Star Trek, and there's a reason that one's second. Uh, all it would take for any any time... <laughs> I can just see it. Any time any sh main ship, any, you know, the Enterprise comes by or Voyager comes by, I would be like, oh, shoot. Because now I know that someone nearby, possibly me, is going to die to prove that the situation is serious. You know, one of the random... And, and then the captain's going to be, like, looking serious. Oh, it's terrible that they died. And that's going to be the extent of my life's impact, is that Picard was a little upset for a few minutes. <laughs> no, I'd take Star Wars in a heartbeat. And uh, for the reasons I listed. It's a little bland, but when you're li limited to the Tier 1, there's not a lot of options, really, when you really think about it. And so, you know... Ultimately, uh, what else am I going to pick at that point, you know? So, that would be what and why. And now I'm done. I have actually threw the massive list of uh, q and I'm glad I decided to do this today, because it's already turned out to be much longer than I thought it, as usual. But I'll probably be doing the Q&A. If, if this level of questions keep coming, I'm going to do this pretty regularly and trying to keep these videos down in size so that 
uh, I'm answering these more, and, and keep answer these more regularly, so I'm keeping it down in size. I'm not even sure I have time to do my uh, my review now for the rest of the night. I don't think I do, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to put that off. I do apologize, but I will be talking to you all later.